All right, it is 9.33. Let's go ahead and get this uh, regular meeting of the Lansing City Council called to order and ask for the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Betts. Uh, present from Lansing, Michigan. Council Member Dunbar. Present from Lansing, Michigan. Council Member Garza. I am here and participating virtually from Lansing, Michigan. Councilmember Hussein. President participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Councilmember Jackson. President participating remotely from the Lansing, Michigan. Councilmember Spadafore. Present and participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Councilmember Spitzley. Present um, participating virtually from Lansing, Michigan. And Council Member Wood. Present and participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Lansing, we have Michigan. eight members present at a quorum. No members are absent and we are to the meditation and Pledge of Allegiance. Very good. Is there anybody that um, folks wish to, uh, that we keep in our thoughts as we have, have a moment of reflection this evening? Miss uh, Councilor Spitzley. You're muted, ma'am. And I don't need to raise my hand. Um, I just wanted to um, have us keep in our prayers, Miss Gladys Beckwith, who passed away recently, strong advocate for women's, um, for the women and women's rights, and you know the the chief founder of the Women's Center. Um, fierce advocate for the Cooley Hay House where the Women's Center was. Um, I remember talking to her about we have to keep that no matter what, but um, it's my understanding she died of complications from COVID. Um, and so um, we want to pray for her. She's a great lady and um, she loved Lansing and it's a loss for our community. Thank you, Councilmember Spitzing. Are there others? I think I would like to just ask that you all keep in your thoughts this at the moment, the folks that have been working around the clock for months to keep us healthy, develop a vaccine from the, the scientists at Pfizer in the folks in Germany to the logistics folks that deliver them to the airplanes at Lansing Capital Region International Airport. Uh, it's quite a feat and, and they worked very hard to try and deliver a, a safe vaccine for us. So keep them in your, if you wouldn't mind in your thoughts as well. Others before I move on? Okay, thank you. If you could just join me in a moment, please. Thank you. Now the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Thank you. Uh, we are to special ceremonies and presentation. We have the Capillary Housing Partnership making a presentation. Yes, I'm Another sorry. Uh, Mr. Van Fossen, uh, let me get Mr. Van Fossen. Nikki Drosty, I think, is there as well. Yeah. So while they're getting, while, while they're getting together, this is a presentation on um, um, the project um, we have um, in setting a public hearing for uh, payment in lieu of taxes for um, the Walter French uh, building on 1900 South Cedar. Um, it is a 6% pilot, if I'm not, yep. And um, the, the proposal is for 70, uh, 72? 76. 76, I, I, was, I, was, I was going up, 76 homes. Um, and then I think there's gonna be some commercial as well, but the pilot is specifically for the 76 um, um, housing units that will be within the Walter French um, building. And with that, but um, oh, we'll take it away. Thanks guys. Thank you, council. And I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen. And I think if I heard in previous presentations, I'll ask the, the question if I can get a, an affirmation that you can indeed see the, the presentation. Yes, we can. Great. So joining me, I'm Raleigh Van Fossen. 
I know many of you. Um, joining me today um, this evening is Mickey Drosty, who's a project consultant with the Housing Partnership, and we're going to try and give a brief presentation about the Walter French redevelopment and, and certainly be available for questions if there may. Um, I would like to give a little bit of background of the Housing Partnership. If you're not familiar with who we are, we have been in operation since 1992, serving the mid-Michigan community as a nonprofit housing developer here in the community with the focus of providing homeownership opportunities and rentership opportunities to our neighbors. And we build that with a foundation of not just creating the opportunity, but ensuring those who have the opportunity to access are also given them the resources to be successful. And that's a variety of programs, both financial literacy and general educational opportunities. You may be familiar with some of our programs. Again, this, this evening, we're gonna speak specifically to the Walter French development, but what makes us unique here as the housing partnership is not only are we based in headquarters in Lansing, Michigan, um, and our board of directors are all mid-Michigan residents, but we are the only HUD certified community housing development organization and only HUD certified housing counseling agency here in Ingham County. And why that's important for council to be aware of is that's a special designation, designation that we at the nonprofit have applied for with the federal government that shows that we have the capacity at both the staff level, the board level, and the operational level as an agency to deliver and meet the needs of affordable housing here in our community. We do that not just with development, but we tailor that with the unique programs to bring a holistic approach to how we address the housing mm -hmm. of our community. So that's our ever popular housing counseling, our one-on-one -on -one personal counseling available to residents who may be pursuing home ownership, they may be facing foreclosure or eviction, or they're just looking for general information about how to sustain a healthy home, both on a budget level and a maintenance level. A tool lending library that we partner with the city of Lansing to deliver residents over 300 tools that they could loan out to them at no cost. We have during pre-COVID weekly do-it-yourself home maintenance workshops, and then our ever popular Tuesday Toolman, which is a group of retired folks um, who meet every Tuesday to complete entry and exit way ramps to seniors in our community and those with a disability. But tonight, as, as Councilman Spitzley introduced, we're here to talk about the former Walter French School. Um, it would be odd to hear you be from Lansing and not be familiar with the Walter French School certainly as it's a landmark building here to the community at the corner of West Mount Hope and South Cedar. In 1925, the school district um, completed its construction of this and opened as an elementary and later a junior high school for kids here in the community. It wasn't until the early 80s that the school district transferred ownership to the Eide family at that time. Um, it went through a variety of uses with the Eide families, both as a, as a charter school, as well as offering some commercial space to a variety of businesses. Um, after the Eide family um, stopped leasing commercial space in the building, it was later added to, in 2010 to the National Registry of Historic Places. That's an important designation to ensure that if any party is renovating the building as it currently stands with any type of state or federal dollars that the integrity of the architectural design and its original um, construction period are gonna be maintained. And as you'll hear in our presentation, that's an effort that we hold dearly and closely to our hearts as we seek funding for this project. However, in December of 2017, we were approached by the city of Lansing at that time because the former owner was unsuccessful in obtaining a demolition permit. And we were in agreement with that thought process. Um, we would have hated to see such a historic building be torn down as we've seen for too many times in years past that historic buildings like the Walter French building are often forgotten and left to the side. And so in 2017, after discussion with the administration at that time, the housing partnership agreed to take ownership of the property with the intentions that we would pursue funding to create an affordable housing opportunity for folks in, in the Lansing community. I'm gonna pause for a moment, let Mickey unmute herself as, as she takes us through some of the specifics to what this project is gonna offer. Thank you, Riley. And thank you, Council, for um, allowing us to talk a little bit about this project, which 
I know we have been talking about for three years. We're very excited to have gotten to a place where we think that we have put all of the financing pieces or at least most of the financing pieces together that we would need for this project. And they are many. Um, so I know that you know, as a part of the financing structure for this, we are applying with Michigan State Housing Development Authority for low income housing tax credits, as well as the state and federal government for historic tax credits um, to help finance both the residential and the, the non residential piece, the historic tax credits would be for that. So um, our multitude of financing sources will allow us to do as stated earlier 76 affordable apartments with a mix of income. So the um, income structure will be um, on the low end, 30% of area immediate income to help some of the most um, desperately in need of assistance, um, persons who need housing. But we're also on the high end gonna be renting to families that are at or above 80% of area immediate income, which as you see on the screen, allows for persons who make up to $25 an hour and are many of those people who are um, working in uh, frontline positions right now out in the community that will need um, housing and, and have housing now available to them in the process. You wanna, thank you. So as we said, 76 affordable units, um, one, two and three bedroom apartments, the gym and auditorium space will remain open space utilized for some sort of commercial use yet to be completely determined. We have been in conversation for over a year with the Board of Water and Light who is interested in potentially using that space for some collaborative space for their organization. So fingers crossed and we're really hoping that that, that pans out. Um, so the site plan for the property um, the, the old classroom space is really what will be utilized as affordable housing. Um, the newest addition of the gym will be removed, which allows then for kind of the central space to be reutilized with windows um, and access, which it right now doesn't have very much of. It also gives us some additional green space um, in the back side of the building for use by the residents. You'll note that um, there's definitely enough parking spaces planned for this. And the wooded area on the bottom section of the screen behind the Michigan Works building is a part of this building as well. And we are in conversation with the Board of Water and Light to um, utilize that space as co-generation um, or power up power generation, both for this building and for um, other uses by the Board of Water and Light. Am I forgetting anything? So the next three slides are some pretty detailed uh, layout for what the building and the use in the spaces would look like, color coded by the types of apartments they are, um, and then the use in the central. The, the old cafeteria is proposed for community space for the residents because there is so much space in corridors and hallways there will be other um, opportunities for community space for the tenants in the building in areas outside of that as well. Probably, you see I'm trying to go really fast so I know you don't want to listen to this all night it's getting late. Um, the, as we said the, the gym and auditorium spaces um, will not be used for residential and we are still finalizing who would be utilizing that space, but we've put together some potential uses because again, it's historic. Um, floor to ceiling walls are not gonna be allowed in these spaces and the basic concept is you have to be able to walk into the door of the space and be able to tell what it was when it was originally built. So whatever the uses will be, um, you will still be able to identify space as auditorium or gym space. I missed you on that one. Um, as stated earlier, we have many um, sources of funding and many partners in this project. So um, we are, have also been in conversation with the development department to talk about the use of some Homer CDBG funds, which we have gotten tentative approval for. 
Um, Sinair is a local syndicator who we, we will be using. Quinn Evans is a, an architectural firm who has a fantastic reputation for doing historic um, adaptive reuse. As a matter of fact, I had a conversation with them last week and learned that they have also been retained by Sparrow to do the Eastern High School. So they will be busy in Lansing um, coming up soon. We talked a little bit about the roles the Board of Water and Light is playing. The Lansing Housing Commission has committed some um, rental assistance as a partner in this project. LEAP has partnered in getting um, and, and awarding some grants to the project for environmental studies. Um, any of the support services that our clients would need will be provided um, by lead agencies of both community mental health Haven House and Advent House. Um, and the surrounding neighborhoods have been very supportive. We've done tours through the buildings and, and gotten feedback from the neighborhoods in order to make sure that we are including things in the project that they would be interested in seeing. I'm not going to say this. <laughs> um, as, as stated earlier, you'll note there's a, a pretty long list of kind of who's providing funding. The Capital Area Housing Partnership is earning a developer fee for doing this project, and it turns out they're going to be one of the bigger sources of funding for this project as well as they are putting back into the project a substantial piece of the developer fee that they would earn off of this. They are also putting some monies into um, reserve accounts to make sure that the services that are necessary are going to be provided and funded and um, any capital improvement projects that need to happen will be fully funded as well. So they're putting quite a bit, putting quite a bit back into the deal. Thank you, Mickey. And I would say, I know, again, tempted to keep it as brief as we could knowing the, the the time of the night but i would certainly open it up to questions we, we did present to the development and planning committee um, prior to this and and have met with city staff over the last three years but um to those of you on council who, who don't have the privilege of being at that committee meeting mickey and i would be happy to answer any questions before tonight's public hearing thank you very much mickey and raleigh for the presentation i'm you know, growing up around here, I'm glad to see that Walter French will have a new life, hopefully, um, the building. Uh, so if there's any questions, um, please raise your hands. Otherwise, we'll move on. But uh, we do have a public hearing this evening for this. Um, Council Member Vice President Hussein. Just clarification. I'm not sure that it was um, uh, mentioned in uh, the lead in or by their presentation. Is this is a 20 year? Is that what we're looking at a 20 year pilot? I would add, Mickey, do you know the year time or is, is, is Don Kulhanek or Brian McGrain still on the call? It is a 20 year. 20 year? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Council Member Wood. Just a quick question. One of the things that we've seen with pilots over the years is as it gets close to the end of the pilot time, they come back to us with the fact that they need to reinvest in the property um, because it's become dilapidated and uh, the there were the funds to take care of it. What are you looking at as far as that? Sure, that, and that's a great question. And, and you know, I'm, I certainly can't predict the future 20 years from now, nor can anybody on this call, but I can say what we do as a developer prior to um, we're strategic in assuring that we're creating the reserve accounts, replacement reserve accounts, so that repairs during the length of ownership um, are taken care of to the best of the ability. But, you know, I can't commit to you to say that the building in 20 years from now won't need upgrades and repairs and that the housing partnership won't seek new financing to ensure that we can continue to create those opportunities for yet another 20 years. I think that's the unique complexities of what makes affordable housing such a necessity for the Lansing community is, you know, we know we have a lack of it here in Lansing, and we know that by offering a property with lower rents that there's going to be some, some investments from a city as a whole. But as Mickey mentioned, we as a developer are committed to putting money in at the start of the project through our developer fee, and we're committed to assuring that there's a replacement reserve that gets funded through our ownership period so that as those repairs become necessary, 
we're making them along the way and we're not letting things fall by the wayside. Is there, do you have a percentage built into this that you're looking at putting into the reserves? We do. Um, what is that percentage? Mickey, I don't know if you know a percentage or, or better yet a dollar amount that the, that the replacement reserve gets funded at. The, race, the replacement reserve is funded um, as mandated by the state at a minimum of $350 per unit per year. Um, and that goes up at 3% per year over the first 15 years of the project. This particular project, we are, our performer right now is written at $375. Per unit per year because we want to see it we wanted to make sure that it was financed so we could get a little bit further ahead starting out in getting enough reserves in the account okay thank you yep. thank you all right thank you very much for your time we will uh, have a public hearing just in a little bit thank you thank you okay our next uh, special ceremony is a presentation from idel properties 2 llc regarding z7 2020 Council Member Spitzley, do you know who's going to be here from Ide? You're muted, uh, Patricia. Um, yes, and I'm trying to. I don't remember his name. I think Doug Fleming is going to be. They should be here. And we brought both of them in. Oh, there we are, Pete. Okay. Uh, we have them. Okay. And, and Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay? Yes. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and I do believe if Doug has joined us in the sharing opportunity, he might have some screen sharing to do as well. Um, many of you are probably more uh, familiar with him. Uh, so I'll do a quick introduction to ourselves just to get started. Um, again, my name is Pete Schwigerat and I'm with MBAH Partners. Um, we are a development company based in Cincinnati and we work throughout 16 states. We've developed, owned and managed uh, around 8,000 units in our portfolio um, and are considered a top 20 developer in the country of multifamily. Um, I think a more important feature of how we do business though is uh, we are first and foremost a long-term owner and also a, a partner with local development groups. And, and that's how um, this, this partnership started is in our effort to, to find local partners that can help um, facilitate and, 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 and assist us in supporting our residents. Um, that's a key feature. Uh, our introduction to uh, Lansing really started a few years ago uh, where we met with staff and administration expressing the same need that you just heard a lot about um, in the previous presentation, uh, a need and desire for additional and, and better quality, higher quality, affordable options. Um, and it took us a few years to find some opportunities that made sense. And, and with that, we've, we think we found a site here that we can move forward. Um, and we've then from there tried to seek out the proper uh, partners to help us uh, bring this together. Our goal is kind of a multi-generational campus where within a development, multiple phases, we can serve um, really uh, all ages uh, and demographics, allowing for opportunity to age in place uh, and really uh, diversify how we can serve residents um, so that no one's left behind. Um, and with that, I'm gonna introduce Doug, who you may know, and. Uh, from, from certainly all the other work that they do in the community uh, to talk about um, how, how the partnership kind of grew from there and a little bit about the site. And, and certainly I can join in what our concept is further as we go forward there. All right, do you see my screen, everyone? Yes. Yes, we do. All right. Uh, welcome, Council. Um, glad to be here tonight. Uh, first of all, a couple of things. First of all, we are um, very excited to be partners with the Capital Area Housing Partnership on the Walter French uh, deal as well. Um, and I think uh, we'll be coming back to you in the coming months with uh, that local group uh, as uh, Mickey and Raleigh and I have had a lot of conversations about the things that we can do together as two local groups, both interested in kind of the same uh, general outcomes. Also excited to hear about Mr. Uh, Bogan's presentation, even though that seems like it was eons ago, uh, and want to commit from the Lansing Housing Commission, um, either dollars or facilities if necessary for that program. I want to go on the record that we are very supportive of that as someone that um, is responsible for almost 3,000 households in the city of Lansing. Security uh, is obviously a big issue, um, safety, 
uh, all of those things. And we wanna be a part of any solution that uh, Lansing has. And my last public announcement is that we're having our ground baking for our own RAD conversion at Mount Vernon on Thursday uh, at 4 p.m. And I wanna welcome all the council members. If you wanna show up for that, you're welcome to do that. But tonight's business is that um, we I have partnered with MVAH um, and then really what I'm going to do tonight is just introduce that partnership a little bit, provide a brief overview of the Stadium North project, and then um, get any questions answered. Uh, Pete talked a little bit about MVAH. You already know who we are. I don't really need to talk about that. Um, they are at one of the leading um, affordable housing developers in the country. Uh, we were approached by them. Uh, we did some vetting. They previously worked with the Jackson Housing Commission as well. Uh, and they also have a project up in Grand Rapids, so they have some Michigan ties uh, as well. Um, in terms of Lansing Housing Commission, why would we join with MVAH? Um, one of our strategic plans has been to uh, basically uh, identify people that could help us move forward our mission uh, in the city. And that is, um, you know, one, we wanna have uh, the right culture, uh, an inclusive culture, uh, demonstrating empathy, trying to actually lift people up. Uh, we want somebody that has great management skills. They've proven that when we did some research on some of their work, uh, leadership, resident services, where we can kind of take some of the stuff that we've already instituted at Lansing Housing Commission and bring that to another property uh, in terms of uh, things that we can do uh, for our residents. Uh, investment, then using some of the money um, that we have or that we're going to earn as a part of this project and reinvesting that in Lansing, just like we are with the RAD dollars. This is one of those type of projects where some of the money that we are generating uh, from the rehabilitation of our existing properties and turning it around and putting it into new high quality, safe, affordable housing in the city of Lansing, and then collaborating um, with those folks. Um, our expected results is that, you know, we wanna have a high performing property, just like um, um, all of our other ones uh, in terms of improving them, uh, get some financial gains, as I said, so that we can go uh, and invest it back in the community as well. Um, right now, uh, Lansing Housing Commission, we're currently um, going to be doing the groundbreaking on Waverly Place, um, which was formerly Mount Vernon. On Thursday, it's a rendering of what those units are going to look like in South Washington Park, um, which will start in January. Um, the new two projects that we're talking about tonight is the Francis Senior Lofts. Um, that's a, um, actually a project, I'm sorry, that's their project that they did in Jackson with the Jackson Housing Commission. Um, that's an actual picture of the building in Jackson. Um, and we would expect to have a similar design uh, to that. And then also the workforce housing uh, is the other property there. You can see in Grand Rapids that MVAH has been involved in. So uh, both of them are high quality, um, good looking buildings. Uh, and they also have a management company that has been very successful over a long period of time in managing those buildings to ensure that um, they maintain the quality throughout the life of the building. And as Pete said, they're long-term owners, so they're not in for the dollar to get in and get out. They really wanna see the success of the building over the long term. Um, the concept here is it's between Cedar and Larch Street. Um, the thought in talking with the development department in the city of Lansing was to kind of extend uh, what you see down in the stadium district a little bit to the north, uh, hence the name Stadium North Project. Um, and we will have two um, uh, projects there, as Pete said, kind of uh, generational, where um, we'll create a, uh, uh, a senior building on the, on the Larch Street part of it, the L-shaped building there, and then the longer building is the uh, multifamily. Um, expected investment would be around $34 million between the two properties. Um, you, can, you can see the land, um, the stadium lofts would be workforce housing, 77 units, and then the senior lofts would be 82 units. 15% um, of those units are, will be project-based by us from Lansing Housing Commission, where uh, folks that qualify will move into those units. And then the income targets and the other um, units will be 30, 40, 60, and 80% uh, AMI. Um, I'm not going to get too much more into that. We've asked for a rezoning request. We got a positive result from the zoning board, and that's where we're at before council tonight. Unless uh, someone has additional questions, I don't want to belabor again understanding the hour. Thank you. Yes, we do have, this is up for an, setting an introduction of the public hearing um, this evening uh, for those of you who are uh, look at, looking ahead a little bit. Um, any questions for Mr. Fleming or um, Pete? I'm not gonna, if you could tell me how to pronounce your name, I'll, I, will, I will pronounce it, but I, 
I don't want to be rude. People do. Schwigerot. Okay. Schwigerot. Thank you. Um, any questions? All right. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank Thanks, everybody. Everybody. Thanks, Thanks for your time. Okay. And we, are, uh, we are to comments by council members and the city clerk. All right. Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay. Members wishing to make comments this evening. Oh, sorry. It's my lights turn off at 10. <laughs> so, uh, Patricia. <laughs> the lights are on. Yes, it's over. <laughs> somebody's home. Um, I just, I want to make two announcements of, of events that are happening this weekend. Um, the first is um, similar to what was done um, over Thanksgiving weekend. There's a drive through giveaway um, on Saturday, um, December 19th, starting at noon. Um, it's at the Village um, of Lansing's parking lot. Um, they'll be giving away non-perishable food and, and we're, they're taking non-perishable foods and toy donations. Um, but um, there will be a drive-in and they'll be giving out toys and food at the village. Um, the second one is a toy giveaway on also on Saturday, December 19th. And I'm sure council member Hussein was probably going to mention this as well, but it's, um, it's for it's, uh, Miranda Hinton is, is doing this and it will be um, in memory of her son, um, Marcus and the Marcus the Comedian Foundation, um, Saturday, December 19th at um, 2 p.m. at the Tabernacle of David. And they'll be also doing a drive-through Christmas kind of giveaway where they'll be giving a Christmas box to each vehicle that comes through. And so again, wonderful opportunities to give back and to help the community for so many people that are um, hurting this Christmas season. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Spitzley. Council Member Hussein, Mr. Vice President. Did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. I did, but I took, I'll tell you what, I had many, many announcements, but in light of the hour, I was going to trim it down to one of the announcements uh, Councilwoman Spitzley just made, so she saved me from that. Very and for all of you from that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mr. Vice President. Uh, any comments from other city council members? All right, uh, Mr. Clerk. Thank you. I just briefly, and I'm not sure uh, if he actually stayed with us, but I wanted to um, wish our best to uh, Lachlan Woods, who's been uh, helping us out uh, as an intern from my office uh, during the last uh, few months uh, during the council meetings. Uh, he goes by Lockie, but uh, congratulations and thanks for your assistance, Lockie. Thank you. Um, with that, we are to community event announcements. If you're um, in the audience and have a community event, uh, we will give you up to one minute to tell us the uh, purpose and uh, details of your event. And it looks like we have Erica Lynn and Galaxy S10 5G for community events. If you're not for community events, please lower your hand. Erica Lynn? Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes, now we can hear you. Okay, hello. Erica Lynn with the Village Lansing. Um, I do want to go thank you, um, uh, Patricia, for uh, letting everyone know. So we do have another effort this, this Saturday at noon, um, very similar to what we did for the Thanksgiving efforts. Um, it is in the Village Lansing parking lot. That's at 3525 South MLK Boulevard facing MLK. Um, we will be giving uh, Christmas dinner out, so turkey and sides, as well as other non-perishable food items, um, just kind of that sustainable food um, that day for noon. It's first come, first serve, one box for, per vehicle. Um, and then also I wanted to clarify as far as donations, we are still taking non-perishable food donations at the village all week, um, pretty much from 11 until about 5 p.m. If you have donations you'd like to drop off, you can look at that list on Facebook or visit um, Facebook for uh, the list. I also want to um, thank and just kind of voice that this is also sponsored in addition to the Village Lansing by Dequia, uh, excuse me, Dequia Quinney Davis and uh, the Eric King Agency. So they are joining me along in that effort. Um, and then also, of course, the Lansing community. 
Um, and then in addition to the uh, other clarification, um, the toy donations ad that actually is over. So we're only taking the food donations. We uh, took our to toy donations to Operation Santa today. That is Jan Mayhew. And those will all go to, go to the Lansing School District children. Um, uh, for the rest of my time, really quick, I did want to also, in addition with you guys offering um, thoughts and prayers, I would also like to offer some thoughts and prayers out with uh, the holidays approaching. It's a very difficult time for a lot of people, especially during the pandemic. Um, but I also wanted for you guys to keep um, the Hulan family as well as the city of Lansing retirees in thoughts and prayers, um, just between us and the city and you all as well. Um, the Hulan family is going through a pretty rough time as well with you know losing their son in the, the city of Lansing jail. And then also the city retirees just hearing their stories tonight. I'd just like to add them to the thoughts and prayers list as well. Um, thank but you. thank you for thank that. You. Um, more info on our giveaway and all of that is on Facebook and our website. Thank you. Okay, then we have to speaker registration for public comment on legislative matters. So now, if you want to address legislative matters, uh, please uh, begin raising your hand. Uh, and that will include the uh, public hearing on Walter French as well as all of the resolutions. Uh, listed under resolutions for action, uh, as well as the ordinances for introduction and ordinances for passage. Um, so while folks are raising their hand, uh, well, first let me announce that um, you do need to raise your hand in order to speak. And after the first speaker is done speaking, we will stop accepting additional raised hands. Um, so please go ahead and raise your hand virtually, um, either on your phone by uh, pressing star nine or on a computer generally uh, so the participant screen there's a button that you can push to raise your hand uh, and while you're still doing that we will go to the mayor's comments uh, thank you mr. thank you mr clerk uh, mr president um, i had a few announcements i'll be quick um, first i want to thank uh, everyone at the tabernacle of david church um, they did a gift card giveaway both councilwoman spitzley and i were there over over the weekend um, and it was fantastic. It was really great, the, the drive through, the, um, the excitement, the being able to, to help out. They, the church really did a great job, thanks to, to Pastor Trice. Um, I wanted to let any small business owner on the call know that the application for the Pure Michigan Small Business Relief Initiative grants goes live uh, tomorrow, December 15th. If you're interested, go to www.michiganbusiness.org slash relief. I um, want to remind people that the neighborhood grant programs, uh, all the applications are available now. So you can go to our neighborhood website um, and there's a neighborhood advisory board meeting on January 21st for grant feedback workshop. Um, our walking Wednesdays are all now online. So the, um, all the walking Wednesdays done over the summer by our department of neighborhoods has been filmed by the public media center. We did one in Southwest Lansing, one in the Baker neighborhood, one in the Walnut neighborhood, one in Oak Park. Uh, and then one at downtown Lansing at First Presbyterian Church. Those are all on the city TV site. Hope you'll take a look. Um, uh, finally, we have two um, drive-through uh, event. Well, we have one drive-through event, the Holiday Night of Lights, which is over at Francis Park, which has just been tremendous. We've heard tremendous uh, feedback on this. And it is uh, the next two weekends from 6 to 9 p.m., Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, and it's been going on the last two weekends. Um, just incredible work by our parks department. And finally, um, we will have a film festival 9.5 uh, this coming weekend. So Friday night at about 5.30 or so, um, there'll be a special uh, projection, nine minute projection movie, which is really cool. Um, that was one of our arts impact grants. And then after that, we'll have drive-in movies downtown um, this Friday and Saturday night. So hope everybody will have a chance to make it to film festival 9.5. Uh, that's uh, what I've got. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, that takes us to the public comment on legislative matters. Um, and as I indicated, uh, it's all of the resolutions for action ordinances for introduction and passage. Um, and uh, the public hearing number one in consideration of the payment in lieu of taxes for Walter French, 1900 South Cedar. And do we want an overview of the public hearing? Or I guess we just had. Yeah, we just had it. Yeah, <laughs> <had a, 
Uh, in that case, we will go ahead and again, uh, once the first speaker is finished, we will uh, stop uh, adding new speakers to the list. Um, so first speaker is Loretta Stanaway. Each speaker will have three minutes. So the first is Loretta Stanaway, followed by Sharon Dave. Good evening, and due to the lateness of the hour, I'm going to keep this extremely brief, so I hope people that want to sign up get their hands up quickly. I am fully in support of the Capital Area Housing Partnership proposals for the Walter French Building. Um, you may realize I don't often support pilots, but this is one that I do support and believe is a very sustainable and needed uh, development for our city, particularly in that location. So yes, on Walter French. And not to belabor the point again and to keep things brief, no on Kmart's rezoning. Have a good evening. Okay, thank you. Um, so that is the end of signing up if you have not already signed up. Um, next we have Sharon Dade followed by Dan Decker. Good evening and happy holidays council members and Mayor Shore. My name is Sharon Dade and I work for Holy Cross Services. Um, I have worked in the Lansing area and lived in the Lansing um, area for well over 30 years. And so I'm really just coming to support the Walter Fritch project. Um, I have been on the board of the Continuum of Care for about 20 years as well as uh, worked in homeless services for over 21 years in the city. And we don't need anything more than what we need is safe, affordable housing. And so I just really want to support the pilot for the Walter French project. And uh, because we need desperately need safe, affordable housing in our city. And I just uh, really appreciate Capital Area Housing Partnership. They are local developers. They have, they're invested in the community. They're invested in the decisions of the community. And I appreciate working with them every day um, in preventing evictions in our community as well as just getting people housed. And so thank you very much. I don't wanna take a lot of your time, but I do wanna just encourage you also to keep in your prayers and, and your thoughts, our essential workers, our frontline workers, our public service workers, our um, nonprofits that are on the line every day and also our transportation workers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Dan Decker and then Bruce Gershenson. Okay, my name is Dan Decker. I live at 1110 Shelter Lane in the Montgomery Drain District. Most people think that the Montgomery Drain project is good, but someone has to pay for it and the city had to find a way to get the funds. So they decided to charge owners according to how much water they put into the drain, just like the BWL does with the sanitary sewers. But the assessments have not worked out that way. Some owners are paying for more water than they contribute and some are paying for less water than they contribute. That's not fair. First, the owners who are being assessed for less water than they put into the drain are the commercial properties who are being assessed for a runoff coefficient of 0.9 meaning that 90% of their property is hard or impermeable surface and 10% is grass or dirt. But they don't have 10% grass or dirt and are nearly all impermeable surface. Therefore, they are paying for less water runoff than they actually have, and that's not fair. State and federal law has the principle that polluters should pay for the pollution they create. The reason for rebuilding the Montgomery drain is to remove pollution going into the Red Cedar River. So what is that pollution? It is mostly metals and hydrocarbons from auto fluids and auto deterioration on commercial parking lots. It's not fertilizer runoff from Frandora Hills residences. Those who have contributed to the pollution for many years should pay to clean it up. Secondly, some owners are paying for more runoff water than they are putting into the drain. This is because residences are being assessed according to their lot acreage instead of the impermeable surface they have on their roof and driveway. So owners with a large lot and a small house are paying much more than their fair share. One of my neighbors, Mr. Umfoot, has a house with two thirds as much roof area as mine, 
So he's putting two thirds as much water into the Montgomery drain as I am. But his assessment is 55% higher than mine. That's $3,700 more. Now, how is that fair, equitable, or consistent? It's because his lot is large, but his house is small. There's just no fairness there. Another neighbor of mine, Mr. Barnes, has a house whose roof area is 75% of mine, but his assessment is $2,300 more than mine. How is that fair? Um, I request that the city council exercise fairness and equity in the Montgomery drain assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Bruce Gershenson followed by Sherry Wigman. Uh, members of council, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. First of all, thank you for um, letting me speak for a moment this evening. You have certainly aware that I am uh, representing the ownership of the Kmart property uh, that is under the ordinances for passage. And I wanted to let you know that I'm available uh, for any questions you may have when that uh, issue comes before you for a vote. Um, we are very hopeful that um, you will see uh, or that you will grant approval this evening of moving forward with the U-Haul project. Uh, again, any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, let me know. I will be on the, uh, the Zoom call at that time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Sherry Wiegman, followed by Chris Buck. Hi, I want to thank the uh, council for um, sticking with the, the issue of the retiree health care tonight. Obviously, it wasn't um, fully addressed by um, retirees in the earlier meeting, but I do have some um, questions and comments. First, Manquin Vans did not show family plans Ms. where Fagan. the costs are significantly higher. Ms. Wigman, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is yes. actually time for legislative matters, and that's not on the agenda this evening. You, there is a second opportunity for public comment at the end of the meeting if you'd like to comment during that period of time. I sure will. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Chris Buck, followed by Wanda Williams. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. My name is Chris Buck and I'm the Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer for Martin Commercial Properties in East Lansing. I'm here to speak to Agenda Item F1, the conditional rezoning of 5400 South Cedar. And on behalf of the ownership of the Jolly Cedar Plaza, just north of the subject site. And I just want to reiterate, I've spoken before, but we are hopeful that you'll approve this rezoning request and allow u Hall to redevelop this long vacant parcel. Uh, this site, as a reminder, is over 120,000 square feet, which is alone about a quarter of all of the vacant retail space in the South Lansing retail submarket. And the absence of large vacant buildings will allow for additional occupancy in neighboring shopping centers and allow for the continuing redevelopment of the South Lansing submarket. Uh, to find a developer agreeable to improve and uh, occupy this space with no financial incentives is virtually unheard of during this pandemic. And I share the opinion of your staff and planning board and strongly support the rezoning of this parcel. And I also am available for any questions if there's any discussion later on about this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Wanda Williams, followed by John Gilmore. Good evening, City Council. I'm Wanda Williams, and I am a Southside resident, and I am also a multi-million dollar real estate producer for the past 33 years in the city of Lansing. And I'm hoping that I'm on the correct agenda item regarding the rezoning yes. of the uh, Kmart parcel. I am in very strong support of that particular project. Again, I do want to reiterate that the uh, current value of the property it now sits at less than $3.5 million. The longer that property sits on the market, that means that the value will go down. It's already been on the market for about four years. And we've got a Fortune 500 company right in our pockets that wants to redevelop that, that property. 
if that property is not rezoned for this particular purpose, the property will continue. Ms. Williams. We, we've lost her. You sit there, the value will continue to go down, which will also equal. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh yes, we can hear you. Hello? You're cutting in and out. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. If the pri only will, but the tax, the tax value to the city of Lansing will also erode. And so I'm really hoping that the city council will strongly consider approval of this project. We very much need it on the south side. And especially with the coronavirus that we are going through right now, brick and mortar is on the way out. This is a good project and we should strongly consider it for the south side corridor. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have John Gilmore followed by Pat Lemon. Uh, good evening. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Jonathan Gilmore. I am the president of U-Haul of Western Michigan. Um, I, you're all relatively familiar with me. I've been in front of you guys for, I think, the past two years or more now. We've been working on this project. Uh, we're extremely excited about this, uh, the investment in the South Side. We have been a business uh, on the South Side for 40 years. We've had the opportunity over the last five years to really do some investment in the community there. Uh, we purchased the hotel uh, up the road there and we have uh, done some wonderful uh, investments in that and turning it around from what it was a blighted property to what it is now, which is, is, is beautiful. We look forward to doing the same thing for the Kmart there. Um, we intend to invest uh, you know, up to $10 million there, uh, creating 10 to 15 permanent positions paying between $12 and $18 an hour. Uh, there's also the benefit between 20 and 30 temporary construction jobs for uh, the duration of the build out uh, on the property. U-Haul as a company has been in business for 75 years. Uh, we primarily deal in moving and storage. And so we deal with people who are moving within the town, as well as people who are moving to the city. So what we do is we're the first stop after you arrive in town. So we draw in thousands of people uh, to the south side of Lansing that would otherwise not go there, giving an opportunity to the small businesses there to introduce themselves to these newcomers to town that would otherwise not get a chance to see the south side or not come over to that side of town. So we're excited to be able to bring business back to this side of town. As I said, we've been in business there for 40 years ourselves. Uh, I'm a, a native of Lansing myself. I used to manage the store there at the corner of Jolly and Cedar. I, I'm truly excited about the opportunity to turn this Kmart back into a vibrant part of the community uh, with green space and, and just, just additional cleanup of the parking lot, safety, lighting, security, working with local PD and others to ensure a safe environment working with the, the, the walking path there to provide some, some bike tools and a bike stop for bikers and just to clean it up so people feel safer going around that building. Uh, there's been comments from many people to us that they don't feel safe walking around there at night. And we would love the opportunity to be able to turn that in from what it is now to a safe space that, that encourages movement around on the south side at night. And again, as it's been mentioned by others, we're asking for no uh, tax abatements. We're asking for nothing uh, in return from this other than just the opportunity to, to transform this property into something that the south side can truly be proud of. And I, I appreciate your time tonight, guys. I know it's getting late, so I'm gonna <laughs> give back my last five seconds here. Uh, thank you. And next we have Pat Lennon, followed by Megan Red. Good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Sure. Well, I've, I've uh, spoken with you before. My name is Pat Lennon. I'm an attorney with the Honigman firm. Uh, I am speaking on behalf of the rezoning of the property at 5400 South Cedar. Uh, I believe you all have my letter dated September 29, 2020. As you know, we've discussed this you know, at, in a, at a high level before. Um, we've provided the legal research that we believe supports 
uh, rezoning of this project in, in accordance with the application. Uh, I just want to let you know that I'm here tonight. If you have any questions, uh, I think the other speakers have uh, said it very well. And um, we hope that you will approve the application. And if questions come up about our legal analysis or the research we performed, we're here to uh, discuss them. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Megan Red, followed by Susan Cancro. Thank you, council members and clerk Swope. My name is Megan Rudd, and I serve as the coordinator for the Ingham County Continuum of Care. I'm joining you tonight to represent the 25 community-based organizations that make up the Continuum of Care. Our members have approved their support for the redevelopment of the Walter French School by Capillary Housing Partnership. For the past 30 years, the Ingham County Continuum of Care has worked to unite part community partners to fight homelessness more effectively. We coordinate resources and services to ensure support for the homeless in our community. We believe our participation and support for the Walter French redevelopment increases the probability that persons who have experienced homelessness and or have special needs will remain successfully housed in safe, sound, and affordable housing. It's community-minded agencies like Capillary Housing Partnership that advances the local goals to reduce and eliminate homelessness in Ingham County. As a member in good standing, the Capital Housing Partnership has proved successful in their 28 years to create safe and decent housing opportunities for members of our community. We remain excited to be part of the ongoing creation and availability of affordable housing units designed to assist our mid-Michigan residents. If approved, the Walter French redevelopment will create lasting change to the residents of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Susan Cancro, followed by Denise. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, well, good evening to all of you. And I know you're probably ready to go home and go to bed at this point. It's been a long night. But I, this is Susan Cancro. I'm the executive director at Advent House Ministries. And I appreciate your hearing us out today. I'm here in support also of the Walter French Project by the Capillary Housing Partnership. And I will just share with you two things. I've worked with the Housing Partnership as the director at Advent House for many years. In those years, I have seen nothing but improvement to the sites that they have overseen and it, with their predecessor organization, and also a great commitment to service to the folks that we serve. And without that, they cannot succeed well. So supporting them brings economic security to people who don't know economic security because it gives them housing first and a place to put their, their feet to set themselves up and to get on with life. So we appreciate your hearing this out. And I'm very excited to hear about all the development going on potentially on the south side of the city where so many of our folks live and call home. Thank you for hearing us out. Thank you for your support. And I'm sure we'll see you at another meeting soon. Have a good night. Thank you. Um, I, had, uh, I had Christy next and Christy seems to have maybe lowered her hand. So, um, Gary, or I'm sorry, Denise, I had next. Uh, and she has lowered her hand. So Gary Garretts followed by Herb Riles. Mr. President, esteemed council members, my name is Gary Garretts. Thank you for allowing me the time to address you this evening in light of the late hour, I'll try to be brief. Should come to no surprise, as no surprise to any of you that I'm opposed to the conditional rezoning that has been requested by U-Haul and the current owners of 5400 South Cedar Street. I sent each of you an email last week wherein I voiced my concerns for a number of things that have been stated by U-Haul and their supporters over the last several council and committee meetings. I raised a number of questions in that email for you to consider as you ponder the upcoming vote tonight. I do not believe the F commercial zoning for this property is obsolete. I believe there are retail users who would still like to purchase or lease the old Kmart and reestablish a retail operation there. Last Friday, I learned from an agent of the owner of Dicker and Deal right here in Lansing that they have been actively trying to purchase the property 
but the owners have stonewalled them and they have not given them even the time of day. They have not even been quoted a purchase price by the seller's broker. I have heard that both Bob's Discount Furniture and BJ's Wholesale Club, who have each opened multiple new locations in Michigan in the last year, are actively looking for sites in the Lansing market. Amazon has opened up a makeshift distribution center in the Logan Square Shopping Center at MLK and Holmes Road parking lot in just the last few months. Has anyone spoken with Amazon about the South Cedar Street property? I believe it is premature to give up on this retail, on retail for this site. Additionally, I have discussed in my email that the Lansing self storage market is currently saturated and is a bad market to bring additional space to at this time. Assuming U-Haul is committed to this course, however, there are other opportunities available, available for properties that are already zoned G2 wholesale in the area immediately around 5400 South Cedar Street. The Robinson Church property immediately west of the Kmart is over six acres and is currently zoned G2 wholesale. It's currently for sale. It seems you all would be better suited to purchase a property already zoned for their use rather than ask the city to change its master plan and zoning ordinance to accommodate what will effectively amount to a reduction in shopping office options for the hardworking people of the neighborhood and community. The South Cedar Street Corridor needs retail and more vibrant uses, not more self-storage. U-Haul has indicated its intent to keep the existing location at the corner of Cedar and Jolly and to operate the converted Kmart store from there. If that's the case, it should make no difference whether there is a Cedar Street frontage for the new adjunct facility, so the Robinson Church property may be a real option. U-Haul has indicated they intend to invest millions of dollars in converting the former Kmart but the Robinson Church property is for sale for substantially less than the Kmart site, and that savings could provide the funding for the construction of new building or buildings on a site that is already properly zoned for the use. Six acres is more than ample ground Thank for you. a facility. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Herb Riles, followed by Julia Kramer. Good evening. Well, everybody Needed. studied this program or this property. I've worked there almost two years next door to it. Matter of fact, the other day I spent my afternoon out sweeping up all the broken glass in the parking lot to keep it presentable. You have an opportunity here, um, which is far from premature when it's almost four years old, that somebody else is gonna jump in and we're blocking the way. This is an investment with the, with the road already po paved for building in front to expand store frontage. I urge the council to accept this. If I was a business looking at investing in Lansing, I'd be carefully looking at how the city council is treating a uh, upfront, no, no penalty, tax-based, sure property for a company and putting them through the hoops when let's get it done. This other guy that wants to sit there and talk about all these other opportunities, that's all I've heard since I've got involved in this is people woulda, coulda, shoulda, but I don't see anybody there. Now do we wait and wait and wait until the building's totally destroyed till the drug addicts take it over to the party and goes on until there's violence in the parking lot? I urge you guys to move on this, pass it. Let's get on the road. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Julia Kramer, followed by Galaxy S10 5G. Hey, friends. Wow, um, let's keep it short. So clearly this is not a big ticket item on the agenda today, but I just wanted to comment in support of Councilman Betts's resolution to restore all utility services to Lansing residents and suspend all utility shutoffs. Um, thank you all council members for your diligence, perseverance and patience. We really appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Galaxy S10. And if you would like to please identify yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Um, all right. So my name is Jonathan. Um, I just want to talk about the unhoused community behind the New Hope Center. Um, so last Friday, they were told that they were supposed to be evicted. Um, and then they were given some more time recently. Um, I, I just want to say that these uh, people, they don't have anywhere to go. A lot of them are elderly or, or they have medical issues. I don't um, believe this is a legislative matter for tonight. Okay. Sure. You'll have an opportunity at the end business. of a meeting for other city government matters, but not on legislative um, time. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank okay. you. Uh, Nancy Parsons Malo is next, followed by the advocates. Can just Am I? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um. I am very much against the Kmart project. Um, how many more storage units do we need on the south side? Uh, you are turning the south side into just a mass of storage units. Um, the Walter French project is a great project. However, I don't support the pilot. Um, we continue to do pilots, and when it comes time for residents uh, to, for our taxes, we end up getting our taxes raised when development doesn't have to pay anything. So that is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is the advocates, and if you would like to identify yourself. Uh, Mike Lynn again. Um, I've been torn on this U-Haul thing. I'm not going to keep you all forever, but the, the, the Walter French thing is a must go. I, I reported to a fire there uh, about three years ago um, where, you know, just walking through that building, which I had attended that school at one point in time uh, and walking through there during a fire and the aftermath of that fire was really disgusting. And I, I would hate to see that that building be tore down. And so thank, you know, thank the eyes for taking that building on and then and hand that over to whoever it is that has it now that's willing to do what they're about to do with it because unfortunately, nobody wants to invest in the South side. We've seen that over and over again. So anybody that is willing to invest in for housing, especially um, amazing. I don't know all the details surrounding that, but definitely would like for that to be looked into and in that project to be thought about. Uh, the U-Haul situation, I again, I, I have to go with what Nancy said again. And in some of this conversation, I'm, I'm a realist in the aspect that you know that that parking lot has been there forever. It's it's usually um, it's usually you know occupied by people riding donuts or somebody selling a truck or a car or just broken glass and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, again, nobody wants to invest in the south side. But on top of that fact, I do understand the aspects of this this owner, you know, blocking people's conversation about anybody else trying to buy that building. And so if you make them keep that at zoning of where it's at, they will have to open up their resources to figure out who else wants it, rather than putting another, you know, another U-Haul storage. Um, we have our storage for the Village Lansing right across the street from our building at Extra Space Storage, and they're building up storage units like crazy. Now they have just built some in their driveway. That's how badly they want to have storage because obviously, you know, for every one unit, they're making two, three hundred dollars off of a unit. So it's just a, it's a, it's a capitalistic thing rather than it is a community service. So for them to keep saying that U-Haul is gonna be cleaned up, we know what it's gonna look like. It's gonna be a bunch of trucks in that parking lot all the way to the street. Um, there'll be no greenery. If they're gonna be, make, make promises to invest in these things, put them on contract to it. Put them on contract. If you guys really want this, contact some of these youth organizations and some of these organizations uh, that wanted that building and, and tell them what you got, you know, got to offer. Um, offering the South Side something means something other than just bringing uh, more predatory uh, buildings down there. Um, outside of that, obviously, the the uh, city utilities. Um, I, I was recently somebody who got my utilities shut off. I was really in amazement that uh, the border wall and light was shutting people's uh, utilities off during this point in time. And no warning whatsoever. Just came home one day, my refrigerator didn't work. Uh, border wall and light, that was back in September, I believe, uh, by way of what the city's putting me through with my, my, with my uh, disability. Um, but outside of that, um, you know, I'm all for the 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 uh, resolution. I'm just not really sure why there has to be one. Border water and light should just stop this. It shouldn't really need all of this. Uh, but I'll talk more on Andy Shore coming up. Tabernacle David didn't invite you either. You're a danger to society. Thank you. 
Um, we are to the referral of the public hearings. Number one, uh, the Walter French. Uh, the Committee on Development and Planning. And we're now to resolutions for action by Council Member Betts, uh, relief to uh, residents on utility shutoff actions. Council Member Betts. Thank you, President Spadafore. This is a quick and uh, dirty one. Um, there, there's been a uh, few houses in my neighborhood in, in the first ward specifically that have had utility shutoffs uh, in September and October of this year. Um, in fact, there were 1,500 utility shutoffs in October of this year across uh, Board of Water and Light. Uh, due to the fact that there's a pandemic going on currently, I think that the best practice for um, the Board of Water and Light is to suspend utility shutoffs and to uh, restart electricity for everybody who has been affected by this. Obviously, this resolution has no uh, effect besides us calling on them to do so. Um, one thing to note uh, in this city charter in consultation with Jim, we're trying to figure out the best thing to do here. And in the city charter, uh, specifically section 5201, it states that uh, BWL is responsible to the mayor and the city council for the provision of utility services in a manner consistent with best, best practices. I would argue that uh, restoring electricity for those who lost it in September and October, specifically during the pandemic, because they don't have the ability to relocate uh, is the best practice here. And I would ask uh, for support from council on this. Other comments from council members? Is there your hand up, Patricia? Patricia, very good. Council members, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, did we, did we get a notice from the Lansing Board of Water and Light that they they just recently restored power? And they did not restore power. Oh, sorry, Pat, go ahead. Did they, okay, that they were, that's what I was asking. Did they restore they, power? Uh, and what was the deal? I know it was that they, they, they stopped shutting off. Electric. From what I understand, they suspended water shutoffs. Electricity shutoffs are suspended through April of next year. However, I, I do think that we need to do, or we need to ask for them to do it throughout the um, total emergency. Uh, however, as I said, there were electricity shutoffs in September and October. Apparently, those have not been turned on, and there have been homes red tagged due to not having. Uh, electricity, which means that there have some been some people who have been put out on the street because of this specifically in my ward. Um, I'll let Council Member Vice President Hussein answer. I have I had communication with the board earlier or last week too that they had they were working to restore the power. Um, soon, I don't I don't know the exact timeline, but what but to coincide with the moratorium on electricity shutoffs as well. So um, I have no problem supporting the resolution. It, seems to call on the board to do some things that they they wanted to do or not wanted to but did did already do so councilman vice president hussein and then i'll let council member Betts wrap up his resolution sure i don't have a, a problem supporting this either i just wanted to make sure that um uh, accurate information was put out there in terms of the water the the residential piece i think that's what um councilwoman spitzley uh, was discussing um there has not been any water shutoffs during the pandemic as a matter of fact i think um, the board, um, you know, predated the moratorium. It was some three weeks. Um, they actually, um, you know, kind of self-imposed the moratorium on, on their uh, residential water customers in terms of shutoffs uh, for non-payment. Uh, my understanding is that the state's deadline um, uh, in terms of that moratorium uh, is December 31st, and they have recently extended that uh, to April 15th to coincide um, with their annual uh, moratorium on electric shutoffs. And I think that's from November 1st to April 15th. Uh, but the spirit of this, um, you know, I, I certainly can support, I think the board, um, I, I also just, um, I wanted to make sure that I had full information going into this meeting. I did reach out to um, Dick Peffley. Um, there were 2,400 residents, my understanding that experienced uh, a utility electric shutoff in terms of residential customers for non-payment. Uh, and he told me that as of, I don't know, some point last week, all 2,400 customers had um, had their, their power restored. Uh, but again, I, I certainly appreciate the spirit of this um, and I, I'll support it. Councilmember Best, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Wood. Uh, thank you, Brent. Best. Councilmember Best. C Councilmember. Um, thank you. And you know, I I will go ahead and support the the spirit of this. I I too, I think a number of us reached out to the board after we saw this to find out where things were. I do want to 
um, state, and I, I don't believe it is all 2,400, but because of eviction issues, um, we have on more than one occasion seen landlords um, who, when there are, they have the ability to shut off power based on non-payment of rent, understand that they do that based on the fact that then they can have code compliance come in and red tag it and the person has to leave based on our ordinances. So I'm I, in no way am I saying that that's all 2,400, but there are ways to scheme the system in order to, to try to go through um, a legal process that right now there was a moratorium on. So um, having said that, um, that, that's my comments on it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, seeing none, if the clerk would please call the roll. The resolution, Council Member Beth. Do, do I need to make a motion first? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's I, 11 I, would, I would move the resolution. <laughs> There's a motion been made by Council Member Betts. Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The resolution is adopted. And we are to the Committee on Development and Planning objecting to the transfer of unsold tax reverted properties. Councilmember Spitzley, I understand you'd like to object to something. I would, President Spadafore. Thank you for asking. So this is um, every year as part of the statewide foreclosure routine, the treasurer gives um, the local municipality the option to take control of these of the properties. And so the, the purpose of this resolution is to, is to decline the acceptance of those properties. I think it's notable um, though that no foreclosures um, of occupied properties happened during the COVID, you know, um, during, during COVID. Um, they also, um, they also, they try to dispose of properties before they come to the city and um, there were 50 properties in the city of Lansing before the auction. Um, five structures are left. They're in pretty bad shape and one needs to be torn down. Eight properties were removed from auction that will become affordable housing through um, a new profit in the city of Lansing. And with that, um, Mr. President, I would move the resolution to um, decline taking over um, the, these five uh, structures or the properties from um, Ingham County. Very good. There's a proper motion in front of us to approve the resolution declining the property. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Betts. Yes, sorry. Councilmember Dunbar. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The resolution is adopted and we're to the Committee on General Services for uh, setting a noise waiver on a uh, Setting a public hearing on a noise special permit. Vice President Hussein. Sure. Uh, we had Ann Perry into our last general service committee meeting. Uh, she discussed this particular project. Um, essentially, public services is going to be replacing the, um, the Miller Road culvert. This is between Pennsylvania and, and Aurelius Road. Uh, the project will require complete closure of Miller Road um, along that stretch uh, for an extended period of time uh, to complete this work. Um, the work will take uh, roughly 10 weeks. It's scheduled from April, I'm sorry, I think it's April 19th to September 3rd. The agenda um, states that it, it'll take 12 weeks and it's between, um, I think, mid-April and mid-October, uh, but that's not what was discussed in committee. Um, and that is not, as what, or not what is reflected in the resolution uh, for your approval today. Um, in any event, uh, the Public Service Department is asking for a 
waiver of the noise ordinance during the duration of the project is on Saturdays uh, for, I think it's from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, in order to allow for uh, the contractor uh, to have essentially the flexibility to get this job done um, it, within that timeline um, and to try to, um, as best as possible, uh, lessen the time that that road is closed and impacting local traffic. Uh, Councilwoman Wood did at, uh, ask as part of the committee uh, meeting how many properties this would affect. Uh, Ms. Perry stated that it would affect two uh, apartment complexes to the east. I think it's two residential houses to the west uh, and that they would all be noticed uh, prior to the public hearing. Um, and that public hearing would be set for, uh, if approved tonight, January 25th at 7 p.m. So that being said, I'd move the resolution. Thank you. There is a motion to approve the resolution. Or is there any further discussion? Just want to clarify, Council Member, who's saying it's 10 weeks on Saturdays, right? Not 12 weeks on Saturdays and Sundays. It's 10 weeks on Saturdays. That's right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Mr. Clark, please call the roll. The resolution, Council Member Betts. That, yes. Dude, you need Council to wake up. You've got a long night ahead of us. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Uh, Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafor. Yep. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. And I was just kidding, Brandon. Councilmember Wood. Yes. AEA zero and is the resolution is adopted. We are to the liquor license for sidecar LLC. Vice President Hussein. Sure. So in this case, uh, sidecar LLC is the applicant. Uh, this pertains to the stadium district. So you got a first floor suite. It's the westernmost um, suite. In any event, we had uh, Miss uh, Kelly Allen, in, uh, who's the attorney for sidecar LLC to our general services meeting. We also had uh, the majority owner, who is Steve Simon, um, in order to, or they were in to discuss the request essentially. Um, they were, they talked a little bit about how in order to bring their, their bar and restaurant online, there are several things they're looking to do. Um, they're looking to transfer ownership of a class C license. Um, they are looking for the approval of a new SDM license and then approval of Sunday sales uh, or a Sunday sales permit, sorry. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward request. Uh, they do have other locations currently open. Uh, Councilwoman Wood asked a little bit about um, food sales versus liquor sales um, with regards to their other locations, uh, their existing business to do about 70% um, sales in food and about 30% in uh, liquor. Uh, Councilman Wood also asked um, about prior liquor uh, violations. Uh, Ms. Allen did uh, state that there were three non-sufficient fund uh, checks written to the liquor, liquor Control Commission, sorry, uh, and one server training violation. Regarding the training violation, however, it was uh, explained that the training was provided, uh, but the proof of the training was submitted uh, late to the Liquor Control Commission. Um, and the only other thing is we had a question on whether or not all city departments uh, had at, in fact signed off. We did not see in our packet that day a, a sign off from Treasury um, that has been uh, uploaded uh, to Laser Fish and as part of your packet tonight. So uh, with that being said, um, I would move the resolution. I think it is proper motion before us. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Clark, please call the roll. Uh, the resolution, Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. I said yes. <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Or Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The resolution is adopted, and we are to the claim disposition for claim number 1794 and 1819. Um, Mr. Vice President. Yep. Um, kind of interesting. We have two separate claims here. Uh, they both uh, deal with red tag monitoring fees for the same location, and that's uh, 1122 Platt Street. Um, there was a first billing uh, for red tag monitoring fees. These are fees of $150 per month. Uh, the first, um, I believe, bill went out in June. Bills have been paid all the way up until November, uh, and then the claimant stopped, um, stopped paying. So we had the claimant in uh, to General Services. Uh, he explained that he lives in East Lansing. He had purchased his home back in May 
of last year um, and quote unquote to fix up essentially in his spare time. Uh, and it was in worse condition than he thought. He had received correction notices from code uh, in October. Uh, so that was six months after purchase. Um, the claimant uh, had a, a structural engineer come out in November, uh, which was now seven months after the purchase uh, to de determine the strength of the foundation. He said at that time he had learned that the home was in worse shape than he thought. Uh, he also claimed that in March, uh, which would have been 11 months after the purchase, he uh, finally moved forward with um, this decision to apply for a demo permit, but due to COVID um, was not able to, to get through that process um, and then even begin the process actually, I think until September uh, after, or I'm sorry, September of this year. Um, this, let's see, the claims review committee did review this on October 15, 2020. Uh, they denied it in full. They felt that our code and policies had been filed closely and that our code office did everything they could uh, to support correction and our remedy before enforcement. Uh, we met on 1218. Uh, we concurred with the claims review committee uh, and we moved to deny in full. So with that said, uh, I would move the resolution um, denying, uh, let's see, uh, $450 in uh, red tag monitoring fees. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Proper motion is before us. Are there any questions? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Claim, Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Uh, yes. Councilmember Jackson. No. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Seven yeas, one nay, the resolution is adopted and we are to the claim disposition of claim number 1815. Mr. Vice President. Sure. This is, this is a big number, so I would encourage you guys to look at uh, the invoice. Uh, I would encourage you guys to look at the pictures uh, that are part of your online packet. In any event, this particular property uh, was cited uh, back in July, uh, I think it was July 31st of 2020. They had a compliance due date of 8-7. Uh, we rechecked the property on 8-10. Violations were still uh, present, so we sent the contractor out and they abated on the 17th uh, of August. Um, the amount of debris in this case, and the reason why that number is so big, um, that was removed was 70 cubic yards. Uh, there were also two uh, tires that have been um, removed as well. Um, there was a reauthorization needed, and that's always a question we ask in general services um, when, we, when we talk about um, you know, an amount of debris essentially that had been removed that did not match the original authorization. Um, the reauthorization did occur um, on 8-17. We actually had our premise inspector go out um, and reauthorized our contract and move um, additional debris. Um, pictures in your packet. Um, this was, you know, this is the important piece of the, uh, the pictures. Do show the bed of the truck uh, filled up on three separate, um, you know, kind of occasions. Uh, and it should be noted that the bed of that truck holds about 24 cubic yards of waste. Um, and a, a lot of this bill, if you look at the invoices, is labor. Um, but in any event, the claimant um, in this particular case, or case, sorry, lives in Mason uh, and essentially uh, claimed he didn't receive proper notification. Um, you know, we looked at uh, our uh, noticing uh, kind of procedure on our, on our end. Uh, it was determined that our notices and invoices uh, were sent following appropriate procedures um, and that we were, you know, that all were mailed to um, the address that was listed for the taxpayer on our record. Uh, and then we had uh, Mrs. Sumner from the city attorney's office talk a little bit about the mailbox rule and that legally when we drop these uh, notices in, mail, in the mail, we have completed our uh, legal obligation. Um, we did, in fact, uh, as part of our uh, process, deny the claim and committee uh, as our code and policies were followed. The amount of work billed was the amount of work carried out. Um, again, this, this exceeds that $2,500 threshold that the claims review committee um, would take a look at. So they did not uh, take a look at this. Um, the claimant, when, when we moved to deny this claimant, you know, seemed to understand why we denied the claim. He did ask that moving forward. Um, we take a look at our procedures and the way, and the way we uh, essentially go through notification. It actually encouraged us um, to leave notices on the building and things of that nature. Um, and at that instance, it was discussed that, you know, we actually are considering um, kind of the above and beyond and what that might look at or look like. But again, we're not required to do so and that hasn't necessarily been past practice. So again, we did move to deny um, this claim in full. Uh, so with that said, I would move, uh, move sorry, the, res the resolution pertaining to claim 1815. Councilmember Wood. Just want to add to Councilmember Hussein's explanation that the um, bill went to the property um, address, 
um, that was what was in BSNA and with the uh, code compliance, not his home address. So whether he was checking the mail at the vacant rental property or not, we have no way of knowing, but we had no other address for him other than the vacant building. And um, so I just, I, I just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you. And it should also be stating, Councilman Wood, that um, this claimant, although he wasn't living at this property, uh, he did state that he was at this property regularly up to two to three times a week. Um, so I, you know, we, we just couldn't believe he wasn't checking his mail, but yeah. Thank you for that extra uh, explanation. Thank you, uh, Council Member uh, Wood and Vice President Hussein. There is a proper motion before the committee, or, I'm sorry, the council. Clerk, please call the roll. On the claim denial, Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member uh, Hussein. Councilmember Jackson. No. Councilmember Spadafore? Yes. Councilmember Spitzley? Yes. Councilmember Wood? Yes. Seven yeas, one nay. The resolution is adopted. And we are to the Committee on Public Services for the special assessment for the Montgomery Drainage District. Sure. Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, um, Mr. President. I'm just trying to get on my, my papers here. I'm sorry for rustling papers. Today in public service, we had, um, first of all, we had, uh, we heard 29, we heard 17 appeals for 29 parcels um, for a special assessment for the Montgomery drain. Um, Mr. Kilpatrick um, did a masterful job of explaining um, how they looked at four different criteria to determine assessment and how it was important to be very consistent um, as we look at um, each in appeal. And so um, we uh, denied all appeals except for two and those were um, not uh, contesting the assessment but um, asking for stormwater credit. And so we did uh, grant those appeals um, for that stormwater credit. Um, we were provided with a, do I have to do a substitute or is this, I didn't even, I just- No, the revised role was approved by the, by the committee and sent to the floor. Yeah, so. And so the, the revised role, um, there was some, um, some question of whether or not we had to do, um, there was a revised role for the drain assessment the estimated cost of improvements for um, the uh, Montgomery drain is $23,700,614.10. Um, the portion assessed to property owners in the assessment district is $11,815,764. And the portion that will be paid by the rest of the city through taxes levied pursuant to section 475 of the drain code is $11 million, $850,307. Did I do that right? That's right, 11 million, it's late, I'm sorry. So I did forward, uh, all of, I made I forwarded the updated individual yeah. role. Right. Oh, it's 23.7 million, $23 million roughly. Um, so the resolution says now, therefore, be resolved, the Lansing City Council hereby directs the special assessment role MD-2020 as returned by this so is hereby ratified and confirmed. And with that, I'll um, move the resolution. Okay, the, the resolution is before us to approve the role for the special assessment. Other questions, Councilmember Wood? Um, thank you, President Spadafore. Just for the record, and I do see Mr. Kilpatrick is here. Um, so since he stayed all this time, he deserves a question. Um, you, uh, <laughs> um, you, it, it was indicated that there were four criteria um, that were looked at. Can you explain what that criteria is so those of us that weren't in the committee um, can understand that since we all saw or heard um, from um, 
the people that were objecting to the to their assessments. Right. Um, so I guess I maybe I should clarify. It's it's really it's it's four factors for residential properties, which is um, it, it's basically a land use factor. So for all of the commercial properties, we used a 0.9 factor. The residential parcels, it depends on the size of the parcel. So, you know, in, in general, let's talk about 0.3 because most of them are 0.3, uh, but they range from 0.33 from the smallest size parcel to 0.25 for the largest. And that is really an attempt to more equalize the assessment amount based on the parcel size. So it, it's, it's one factor that's used um, but, or different factors, but just it's in one part of the formula that it's, it's used. So it's really basically the parcel size times a land use factor. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there other questions? President. All right, thank you. I was, I was writing down something, thank you. Um, I see no other hands. So um, you've made the motion, Council Member Spitzley. Um, I would ask the clerk to please call the roll on the roll. The roll on the roll. Um, on the special assessment, Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The special assessment rule is adopted. We are to the committee of the whole. Mr. Clerk, before we move on, Mr. Kilpatrick, what tax, this will end up on the summer taxes if they don't, if the, if the parcel owner opts not to pay it all up front. Correct. It, it will be a, a special bill that goes out. Um, I think it's within, Jim, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was, there's a time period after that we direct the assessor to prepare the roll and send it out, send out the invoices. And then if they do not pay in a certain period of time, then it would go on the taxes. And the next one that would be eligible for would be the summer tax roll because obviously winter tax bills have already been sent out. Jim, I think for the purposes of this question, unless Joe has it off the top of his head, the purposes of this question, it's the summer tax roll is what most people want to know about. Joe? Actually, I didn't have that specific answer, but I did agree with, uh, with no. uh, uh, Andy Kilpatrick's analysis of that. Thank you. And also just for the 85 folks, if any of you are listening uh, relative to this subject or folks watching on TV at home, it is, uh, you received your winter tax bill and there was an assessment for the Montgomery drain, but it was the drain tax, not the assessment. So every homeowner got the tax, but the assessment has not been formalized until just now. So just wanted to clarify that. Thank you all. Moving on to the next, uh, to the clerk, Mr. Clerk. Okay, we are to the Committee of the Whole for the confirmation of appointment for Elizabeth West. Uh, Vice President Hinton. Sure, so this uh, is, I'm sure, still fresh in your mind. We just had uh, the, um, the appointee uh, in the Committee of the Whole. Uh, she talked a little bit about, um, uh, you know, her educational professional background in law. Congratulations, by the way, on her recent nuptials. Uh, in any event, she is a licensed attorney in the state of Michigan. She currently works for the Friend uh, of Court Bureau um, the Board of Review, um, not the Income Tax Board, but the Board of Review was her uh, top and only choice. She talked a little bit about how uh, an individual on the board had actually uh, approached her. Uh, there was a vacancy. I thought she'd be a great fit. Um, and we certainly, after intervie interviewing her, sorry, um, agreed. Uh, and we supported uh, her appointment to, again, the Board of Review unanimously. So with that said, I would move the resolution of confirmation of appointment for Elizabeth West. Thank you. Motion before us. Any further questions? Seeing none, with the clerk please call the roll. On the appointment, Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Council Member Spitzley. I said yes, that was not me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and Council Member Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays, the resolution is adopted. We'll be swearing her in at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> so we need to finish the council meeting before that. Before that. <laughs> um, we're to the recertification redevelopment ready, ready communities program. Vice President Hussein. 
Sure. Um, again, we took a look at this uh, earlier tonight. Uh, we had Brian McGrain in uh, to discuss this. Um, Lansing was selected by the Michigan Economic Development Corporation to uh, participate in this program. Um, 2014, uh, he talked a little bit about uh, the fact that we were certified uh, for the first time through this program in 2017. Um, I guess part of the initial uh, certification process, um, well, I, I should say certification and recertification process uh, involves going through kind of a comprehensive review uh, with the MEDC of our development process here in the city of Lansing. Uh, we have our partnerships with uh, boards and agencies such as the LADC um, evaluated, uh, and then we take suggestions for improvements uh, in our processes, um, such as uh, you know cross departmental communication and the like, um, and then we and then we implement. Uh, so the certification uh, is meant to communicate that we are right to the world, right? We are development ready. Uh, it was mentioned that this process um, certification has also allowed us to pull down state resources uh, to support economic investment and redevelopment. Um, so this is a good thing. So that being said, I would move the uh, resolution for recertification as part of the I'm sorry, redevelopment ready communities program. Thank you. The motion has been made. Um, are there any questions? Seeing none, Mr. Cook, please call the roll. Okay, on the recertification, Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays, the resolution is adopted. And we are next to the um, setting a public hearing for the Parks and Recreation Draft Master Plan. Vice President. All right, we have uh, been putting these five-year master plans together for decades. Uh, we have Brett Kaczynski in earlier uh, to talk uh, to us a little bit about this process. Obviously, it's been a unique process this year with COVID. Um, you know, we typically put these together uh, with, with robust input, uh, input, sorry, from citizens really throughout the city. Um, it's, it's really important to note that not only, you know, does this drive some decisions, some internal uh, decisions about um, our parks, about our recreation opportunities and what those look like over the next, you know, several years, um, it's, it's also um, mandated that we have a park master plan in place in order to receive um, trust fund grants and the like. Um, it was explained to us earlier tonight that the park board did in fact uh, review um, the draft master plan. Uh, they took public uh, input virtually, uh, but most of the input um, was, was received via surveys. I think there were over some 600 surveys uh, that were completed and submitted to parks from various stakeholders uh, really throughout the city. A um, few of the goals and objectives uh, for parks and recreation uh, were discussed in terms of what's in that master plan. Uh, those included uh, connectivity, accessibility, uh, resilience when considering COVID-19 and climate change, um, diversification uh, and placemaking opportunities. Um, the Department of Natural Resources uh, environment does require a public hearing be held by this body. Um, so that uh, public hearing will be held uh, should this resolution be passed January 11th at 7 p.m. So that being said, I would move the resolution. Yeah, thank you, Vice President Hussein. And per Council Member Wood's request and suggestion, we're gonna look at the calendar to see if we can find a time for a cow meeting or possibly public service. It looks like the only other Monday in January is MLK Day um, that we don't already have a meeting. So I will, we'll, I'll, I'll get to work on that with Sherry, who I think is sending me an email now. She's texting me, so <laughs> she's very efficient. So uh, no more questions or comments on that. We will move the resolution setting the public hearing. Uh, Mr. Clark, please call the roll. Um, on the say the hearing, Councilmember Vets. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. AEA zero nays, the resolution is adopted. And that takes us to ordinances for introduction uh, by the Committee on Development and Planning, following ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan, providing that the code of ordinances be amended by providing for the rezoning of property located in the City of Lansing, Michigan for the revision of the district maps adopted by section 1246.02 of the code for property located at Z72020 
uh, 500 North Cedar Street and 514 Erie Street from H Light Industrial District to G1 Business District was introduced by the Committee on Development and Planning, read a first time by its title and refer to the Committee on Development and Planning. Sure, I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. The first one we have before us, and we had a presentation on this already earlier this evening, is a rezoning um, Z-7-220, 500 North Cedar Street and 514 Erie Street, rezoning from H Light Industrial District to G1 Business District. Um, we had a discussion um, from the Lansing Housing Commission and their partners. They proposed to build two buildings. Um, one is a senior loft with 82 units. The other one is a multifamily with 77 units. It's a $34 million um, investment. And with that, I would move the resolution that sets the public hearing for January 11th. Proper motion. Uh, any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, if the clerk will please call the roll. On the public hearing, Council Member Betts? Yes. Council Member Dunbar? Yes. Council Member Garza? Yes. Council Member Hussein? Yes. Council Member Jackson? Yes. Council Member Spadafore? Yes. Council Member Spitzley? Yes. Council Member Wood? Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays, the public hearing is set. And we are to. Um, the following ordinance of the city of Lansing, Michigan, providing that the code of ordinances be amended by providing for the rezoning of property located in the city of Lansing, Michigan, and for the revision of the district maps adopted by section 1246.02 of the code for property located at Z8 2020 2918 Northeast Street from F Commercial District to H Light Industrial District was introduced by the Committee on Development and Planning right the first time by its title and referred to the Committee on Development and Planning. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. We're going to be really quick. We're, we are establishing the, um, introducing the ordinance and saying a public hearing on this for January 11th. It should be noted that this um, location at 2918 Northeast Street is a medical marijuana grow facility. Um, they are currently operating out of compliance with zoning. Um, they also have several um, violations. Um, it's zoned industrial, but it needs zoning for, it needs the zoning to be changed for compliance and a permit. Um, let's see, the, the, the planning staff is not supportive of this, um, this rezone you know, because it um, flies in the face of good zoning practices. The planning board, however, did recommend approval against the recommendation of staff. Um, with that, um, I will move the resolution and set the public hearing for January 11th. Thank you, Councilmember Spitzley. Are there questions for Councilmember Spitzley? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? On setting the hearing, Councilmember Betts? Yes. Councilmember Dunbar? Yes. Uh, Councilmember Garza? Yes. Councilmember Hussein? Yes. Councilmember Jackson? Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Councilmember Wood. Hello? Yes. Yeah, here we go. Okay, eight A zero and A's. <laughs> eight A zero and A's. Uh, the resolution is adopted to set the public hearing. And uh, we are now to the Committee on General Services. Uh, the Committee on General Services introduced an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan to amend Chapter 240, Sections 240.01, 240.02, 240.03, and 240.04 of the Lansing Codified Ordinances to restructure the grant award process for basic human services. The ordinance is read a first time by its title and referred to the Committee on General Services. Council member, Mr. Vice President. Thank you. Uh, just a little background on this. Um, this pertains to, um, well, we have an ordinance um, that mandates that 1.25% of our general fund revenue uh, goes to providing for basic human needs in, in our community. We've given out 
uh, millions over the years um, uh, due to this ordinance. In any, in any event, sorry, I can't speak tonight. I've been in the seat since maybe 7.30 a.m. I got to stand up and get some oxygenated blood to my brain. But in any event, um, we primarily do this by awarding um, grants uh, to qualifying agencies that then use that money uh, to provide for basic human needs. Um, what this ordinance does is really restructures the grant award process uh, for basic human services by adding additional structures, um, internal controls, um, and guidelines for HRCS and the city of Lansing to adhere to um, when looking at the grant award process um, and, and add some additional oversights uh, of the program uh, in grant awards. Um, there, you know, we've had some issues, um, some referenced uh, earlier tonight with potential you know, past conflicts of interest um, which have made these changes necessary. Um, so what we did essentially over the past, I don't know, maybe a couple months in general services, we actually, along with uh, representatives from HRCS, as well as the city attorney's office, we worked through several drafts um, and we have arrived at draft six. You guys in your packet, your online packet, um, have the original uh, ordinance um, that was referred to us uh, in terms of the amendments. Um, I stumbled upon that uh, earlier today. I apologize for not seeing that uh, earlier. Uh, so I did ask uh, off, our office manager to uh, for a draft six to you. So you should have that in your email. Um, what I'm going to do very quickly, like very, very quickly, is go through just some of the substantial changes. Um, and then I'm going to punt um, to Mr. Smirka. So Mr. Smirka, hopefully you are still with us. You are. Um, and, and I'm going to start really quickly at the bottom of page one. So when you look at definitions, um, really what we did is we expanded and enhanced the definition. So we uh, made some changes to basic human services to make clear that uh, programming uh, that supported, whether that be city or agencies, is to benefit Lansing residents. Uh, and then we also expanded the definitions to add housing and tenant services. Um, we added a reference to the city appropriations ordinance regarding allocation. And then there's actually two new definitions in there. Um, I was surprised to see that um, there really was no mention of the HRCS director or the HRCS advisory board, uh, board sorry, in chapter 240 as it exists. Uh, so we did add those and added definitions uh, for those uh, positions in the or I should say that position in that body. Um, if you look at the funding formula at the bottom of page two, um, there were a few big changes, uh, including the addition of language in section B um, to reflect current practice, uh, where most money is utilized by HRCS to, pro to provide basic human needs uh, through grants to agencies. But some dollars have been uh, utilized by other departments to provide for basic human needs. And uh, so one of the uh, examples discussed in committee was uh, parks uh, and, the, and the pantry that they put on um, in the different, uh, in the myriad of parks that we have throughout our system. Uh, also adds language in section C um, that all funds utilized for grants uh, to city departments and qualifying agencies shall be dispersed to an application and uh, bidding process uh, that comports with our purchasing and competitive bid process, our sole source requirements and other relevant ordinances um, and that also outlined in subsection C uh, three and four, that all applications be evaluated and ranked by the HRCS advisory board um, with the internal auditor, uh, should we ever hire one, right? Uh, as a potential advisor uh, throughout the process. Um, it also does require each member of the advisory board to file an affidavit of the, uh, disclosure with the city clerk for potential conflicts of interest. And it make clear, makes clear, sorry, that all recommendations go to the mayor for review and approval. And then if you go uh, about halfway down on page five, you're, you'll see um, administration. Um, and really what we did here, we wanted to first clarify that contracts and depart, uh, with departments, sorry, and agencies, after all provisions of the ordinances are followed, um, are only entered into after review and approval by the mayor, the finance director, the city attorney, uh, that affidavits of disclosure have been filed with the ethics board. Uh, so we wanted to add some layers of review, obviously there. Um, and then there's a new section under administration. It's found near the top of page six. It has seven provisions, sorry, seven provisions uh, dealing with the process and awarding grants. Um, these include making applications and grant uh, fund information available to the public. Um, you think posting on the city what city's website um, or in um, local periodicals, uh, things of that nature. Uh, requiring a public informational meeting for potential applicants and the general public prior to the application deadline. Uh, requiring that um, uh, metrics demonstrating past successes of applicants and conflicts of interest uh, disclosures be provided to the HRCS board prior to their review uh, and consideration, uh, ensuring that the HRCS is direct, uh, director's recommendation, sorry, to the mayor occur only after uh, the HRCS board reviews uh, and thoroughly vets uh, the applicant's history uh, and their ability uh, to fulfill um, the, the requirements um, and then the mayor making the final decision as part of his or her recommended executive budget to council. Uh, lastly, item six and seven, uh, speak to the HRCS director uh, providing approval letters 
to successful applicants, but prior to funding, the agency's principal officers and, and direct uh, director, sorry, must file a disclosure or statement prepared by the city attorney regarding actual potential conflicts of interest. Um, so if you look at what we had uh, and what is now before you, um, again, uh, you know, really what we did was provide for um, just explicit um, review, um, checks, um, balances, um, and, um, and some added internal uh, controls. What I would do at this point um, is kick it over to Jim. Jim, if I missed anything, um, if there are points that, that need to be clarified, I certainly appreciate um, you inserting yourself at this point, my man. Thank you. Well, your committee did a wonderful job analyzing it. You didn't leave much for me to comment on here, um, except that, um, you know, if you want to use some, some words here, it's competitive, it's posting on the web page, it's a public information meeting, and the conflict of interest disclosures on both sides, the advisory board and the recipients. A lot of this is, is also going to be used, uh, be used for HUD in, in um, trying to amel ameliorate some of those penalties they want to assess. And that's why the conflict provisions are in here. That's all I have. I appreciate that. Um, just very quickly, I want to thank um, Kim Coleman uh, who worked with us uh, along with um, several individuals from the HRCS department. Um, I wanna thank uh, obviously Jim and his team that did a fantastic job in serving as kind of our guide on the side. And then I certainly want to um, thank Councilwoman Wood as well as Councilman Garza for their work as part of the General Service Committee uh, as we went through this. Um, and ultimately I got this ready for your, uh, your review. In any event, what we're looking to do is set a public hearing um, on this and that would be set for January 11th. So with that being said, I'd move uh, the resolution to set the public hearing. Thank you. There's a proper motion for us, and I see a question or comment from Council Member Wood. Thank you, President Spadafore. As I did during the committee process, I did uh, disclose, and I want to at this point, that um, the agency that I'm employed at um, does receive um, funding um, from the HRCS 1.25. Um, and so if um, people have a concern about that, I have no problem with recusing myself um, as part of this process. So um, it is up to the body. Councilmember, what did you participate in the discussion on this? Yes, I did, but I also made the um, the disclosure during the committee and Mr. Smirka at the time said that um, he had no problem with me uh, participating in the discussion since this would be uh, voted on by the entire council. And um, so it was up to the council to determine at this point, you know, before any decisions are made, whether um, they felt that I, that there was a conflict. I'm just, I, don't, I personally don't see a conflict. If, if we were at the appropriation stage, I would have a different opinion, but I don't yeah. see a conflict here. Right. So if anyone else has a different opinion now, speak now or forever, hold your peace. We'll call for the roll. All right. I'm going to call for a roll. Thank you, Council Member Wood, for disclosing. Thank you. Mr. Clerk. You got to unmute yourself. But I, I bet, I bet oh, he said Council Member <laughs> Betts. Uh, you're psychic. <laughs> My answer is Dunbar. yes. <laughs> Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays, the public hearing is set. Um, we are two ordinances for passage by the Committee on Development and Planning. We have an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan, providing for the rezoning of a parcel of real property located in the City of Lansing, Michigan, and for the revision of the district maps adopted by Section 1246.02 of the Code of Ordinances, Z8-2019. 5400 South Cedar, 
re conditional rezoning from F commercial and J parking districts to G2 wholesale district is read a second time by its title. The ordinance was reported from the committee on development and planning and it's on the order of immediate passage. Council member Spitzley. Thank you, um, Mr. President. And I'm gonna be brief as well. This is the uh, uh, Kmart property that we've heard um, so much about. Um, and um, with that, I'll move the resolution. Thank you, Council Member Garza. Sorry about that. I, you said thank you, Council Member Garza. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Council you Member Garza. me too. <laughs> it's late. It's late. Okay. Sorry. So I just wanted to um, basically say um, the reason why I'm voting no tonight on this, you know, based on a number of concerns raised by my constituents and neighboring property owners, I will be voting no on the conditional rezoning for F commercial and J parking district to G2 wholesale at the 5400 South Cedar Street. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, uh, Mr. Clark, please call the roll. Okay, on Z8 2019, Council Member uh, Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. No. Council Member Hussein. No. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafor. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Council Member Spitzley? Oh, I'm here. Uh, are you a yes or a no? Um, yes. Council Member Wood? No. Five yeas, three nays. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you. Um, do we need? No, it's You can't. Oh, yes, got it. <laughs> Listen, it's late. <laughs> <laughs> I got you there. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, we are uh, to an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan, providing for the rezoning of a parcel of real property located in the City of Lansing, Michigan, and for the revision of the district maps adopted by Section 1246.02 of the Code of Ordinances, Z2-2020, 5528 South Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, rezoning from D1 professional office district to F commercial district is read a second time by its title. The ordinance was reported from the committee on development and planning and is on the order of immediate passage. Uh, sorry, uh, council member Spitzley. This is a property um, that um, is on Martin Luther King, but half the property is less than half of the property is zoned D1 professional office. The rest of it is zoned commercial. It's, it's really a correction in zoning. Just a small sliver of it is zoned D1 professional office. Streamline Enterprises Construction Company proposes to move in there and conduct business. And with that, I move the resolution. Thank you, Council Member Spitzley. Any questions on this rezone? Mr. Clark, I see no questions. Please call the roll. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The ordinance is adopted. And that takes us to uh, Z3 of 2020. Uh, an ordinance of the city of Lansing, Michigan, providing for the rezoning of a parcel of real property located in the city of Lansing, Michigan, and for the revision of the district maps adopted by section 1240. 6.02 of the Code of Ordinances, Z3, 2020, 1030 South Holmes Street, rezoning from B residential and D1 professional office districts to DM4 residential district is read a second time by its title. The ordinance was reported from the Committee on Development and Planning and is on the order of immediate passage. 
Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. This is the former Home Street School. Uh, the proposal is to rezone and turn the school into um, uh, single use apartments. Um, this is just, this rezone is just at this point in, um, for, the, um, for the school. Um, that I would move the resolution. The motion has been properly made. Is there any discussion on this item? Councilmember Wood. I promise to make this short because I know this is the last item of um, business that we have before public comment again. Um, Councilmember Spitzley, you said that this is just the school. Is there another um, item that's coming before us to deal with this particular property? I think that when we had the when we had the uh, discussion by the um, developer, um, I think there is there may be a phase two later long down the road, but right now he's focused school. And my next question is, um, this is not conditional zoning, so there's nothing in it that um, makes sure that there is a green space available um for the neighborhood is that correct they talk he talked about green space and that was one of the reasons why i mentioned that he's just um working on the school because the initial um drawings that we were shared with and those were not his drawings but conceptual drawings did show a a, a very 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 lack of green space but the developer came in um he committed to green space i think there was also discussion of maybe some common areas in the apartment. Um, and so he is just going to be developing um, the school at this point, but, and he is committing to maintaining some green space. Um, Council Member Betts, is that what, because I know that you were concerned about that. Is that what you understood as well? From what I understand, we're rezoning the entire parcel uh, to DM4 residential, which would basically mean that they could redevelop the property. Um, the green space is still a question because they'll have to produce a site plan and things like that to uh, give to the mayor's office and all that to be approved. Uh, um, the developer did point out that this green space is owned by the um, and uh, they have the right to redevelop this property either way. So I, I think that those are the only additions that I would make to uh, uh, Councilwoman Spitzley's comments. So um, I, you know, I go back to knowing when this uh, was an original school building and the work that the neighborhood did and the commitment at various times that there be a green space that be that would be available um, for the neighborhood. And the fact that this is not conditional zoning um, gives them the ability to do whatever they want, which this is um, rezoned, um, as long as it qualifies under the rezoning. And the site plan, um, it, they can't force them to have so many square footage of, of green space. So um, I, I won't be supporting this. Thank you. Okay, I see um, no other hands. So if the clerk would please call the roll. Um, <clears throat> Rezoning council member Betts. Councilmember Beth votes yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. No. Seven yeas, one nay. Uh, the is adopted and we are to speaker registration for public comment on city government related matters so that is your opportunity to speak about any city government related item please go ahead and uh, raise your hand virtually 
uh, and we will be to that uh, actual item in a few minutes. And again, um, once we uh, have finished with the first speaker, we will stop accepting additional hands raised. In the meantime, we're to reports of city officers, boards, and commissions. Uh, Mr. Vice President, a motion will be proper sure. for you. I would move that uh, all items be considered as read in full and that the appropriate referrals be made by you. There's a proper motion before us. Would the clerk please call the roll? On the referrals, Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. So we will do the referrals. We have letters from the city clerk regarding minutes of boards and commissions. Place on file. Uh, elected officers compensation commission say in the first meeting. Me the whole. Letters from the mayor, appointment of Matthew Lency to the airport authority. Intergovernmental relations. Appointment of Nate Scramblin to the parks board. Public service. Appointment of Ashley Williams to the DLI board. Development and planning. Appointment of Molly Korn to the Potter Park Zoo board. Public service. Appointment of Melissa Jeffries to the next Michigan Development Corporation board. Development and planning. Uh, budget authorization to allow LEFA to move funds uh, from the subsidy. We do the whole. Communications and petitions, a claim appeal claim uh, from Kenneth Dagner on behalf of Nicholas Dagner for trespass violation of 1416 Vermont. Committee on General Services. Communications demanding a vote of no confidence for Mayor Shore and Police Chief Green. Place on file. Communications in support of Invest in the People of Lansing Resolution. Place on file. Communication regarding the Montgomery Drain Assessment. Uh, place on file. Um, communication from the Liquor Control Commission, uh, licensing appeal decision for LMC store at 2200 West Holmes. The Committee on General Services. And another communication from the Liquor Control Commission, application transfer ownership uh, at 6065 South Washington Avenue. Committee on General Services. We are to remarks by council members. Are there remarks by council members? I would just like to say all a uh, very happy holidays to you all and your families. Um, also, thank you. It's we've survived 2020 together. So it was not, I don't think it's concluding how we thought it was start going to start, but here we are and thank you all for a, a great year together. Please enjoy some time off um, and we'll see you back here on July, January 4th. <laughs> thank you. All right, we are to remarks by the mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All set. Okay, uh, public comment. Our first speaker is Loretta Stanaway followed by Ash Rawl. And again, once Loretta is done, uh, we will be closing sign up. Go ahead, Loretta. There, now I'm unmuted. Okay, um, briefly again, I'm really disappointed in the passage of the U-Haul situation. I'm especially Disappointed with the fifth voter in favor of that. Um, most of the supporters or all of the supporters for it were people who will in some way benefit from it financially and they don't have to live with the results. I probably should have remembered to say during my initial comments that this would not have passed under the form based zoning and that they have not spoken at all about the dangers created by the propane on site which cost a man and his grandson, significant injuries. And I don't know directly, I haven't heard for sure, but I heard through the grapevine that one of them didn't survive. I don't know if that's accurate. I know a dog did not survive. I know an RV did not survive. So again, very disappointed in that result. And um, all I can say is it's one more thing on the list of reasons to move out of town.
Thank you. Next, we have Ash Rawl, followed by Su Susan Rouse. And again, uh, if you have not signed up, uh, we are cutting that off now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. I'm glad this evening you heard about advanced piece from founder and CEO, Mr. Bogan. You must adopt the system. It has been proven in action. I sense that my sharing sentiments about the beauty of diverting people from a place of harm doing to a place of growth and redemption may not be something every member of the council cares about. So I'd like to reiterate some statistics instead. According to reports on the website for Advanced Peace, since its inception in 2007, the city of Richmond has experienced an 82% overall reduction in total shootings involving injury or death. In Sacramento, by the end of 2019, there were no juvenile homicides since early 2018 when the Advanced Peace was launched in that city. If for some reason money is more important to you than human life and the prevention of harm, in Sacramento, $29,200,000 were saved from firearm homicides and assaults that Advanced Peace helped prevent in 2019 compared to 2017. In Richmond and Stockton, massive amounts of money have been saved as well. According to Zach Norris, author of the book, We Keep Us Safe and Executive Director of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, in the five years following adoption of the program in Richmond, the average number of homicides in the city had been 18 per year compared to 41 homicides per year before that in the five previous years. So the, the results come quickly. Please adopt the system here in Lansing. I'm also speaking today to demand that police officers wear masks, to demand a vote of no confidence for Andy Shore, and to demand a hearing on the Lansing Police Department murder of Anthony Hillon and the police brutality on Baker Street. The reality that your police, police officers are able to charge citizens for not wearing a mask and following public health guidelines while they themselves are not wearing a mask and breaking the very law you've charged them with protecting is ludicrous and unjust. You have to do something about that and not just sit by while it happens. The rest of my comment I've said before and I'll say it again. The coroner ruled Anthony Hulon's death a murder, so there's no way around that truth. And police chief, the police chief and other officials lied to us when they said something like George Floyd's murder couldn't happen in Lansing, knowing full well it had happened to Anthony Hulon. The recent police brutality on Baker Street was dangerously close to another incident of mur murder of a police, sorry, murder by police of a civilian, and happened so shortly after the news reporting of Anthony Hulon's murder that it is very clear the department didn't take that murder seriously. The man um, the Lansing Police Department officers brutalized came to them asking for help. And we have video footage of the horrifying response he received. They received similar, sorry, they used similar tactics that were used in the murder of Anthony Hulon. And I fear for what would have happened if a, had, a passerby hadn't videotaped the situation and made his presence known. This passerby was then told to leave the situation because clearly the officers involved didn't appreciate having their disgusting actions caught on camera. Shutting down transparency seems to be something they like to do when they know they've done something wrong. And this happened because he was a black man. I, a white person, wouldn't be met with that level of violence where I to seek police help. There must be a hearing. There must be a vote of no confidence for Andy Shore. And thank you. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Um, next is Susan Rouse, followed by Paul Colbro. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you to the council for all their work and time committed to the retiree health care issue. I'm sorry, it is very late tonight. Uh, it's abundantly obvious that the trigger was pulled early uh, on altering retiree health care prematurely and carelessly without a complete evaluation of the impacts on various contracts affecting bargaining groups over 65, under 65, and duty disability retirees. Mr. Smirka made comments tonight that were in total contradiction of each other, and I'm not sure where his interests lie. He indicated he sought the outside opinion of Clark, who at some point this year created another legal opinion for some city uh, of Lansing client. He also said he has requested a review from the ethics board about his own involvement in the legal opinion or if he should recuse himself. When asked by council member Wood tonight about his actual opinion, which was requested a significant time ago, Smirka said that it would be ready in two weeks. If you believe you need to recuse yourself, Mr. Smirka, how can you render an opinion? Um, has the ethics board ruled on this? And what is the ruling? It seems like the cart is being put before the horse in many aspects here. I'm pretty sure the only opinion that should be rendered at this time is the opinion to stop what is happening so the legality of it and the contractual implications of it can be evaluated before the city does incredible harm to the retiree population. How did Mr. Smirka know that Mr. Clark the contracted attorney happened to have this opinion just laying around. How did he know it would be applicable to this situation? It is very troubling that Clark seemingly has not even reviewed current contracts that are still in effect through 2022. 
Mr. Clark made it clear the contracts in effect should not be breached. Anyone who is responsible for shielding the city of Lansing in their best interest would not allow any of this to move forward knowing that it will breach current contracts and cause a legal suit against the city, which will cost the city more money ultimately. Again, I applaud the council. I actually wish more of you were vocal in the face of what we can clearly see. Even a young caller tonight, probably 14 or 15 years old, indicated that they could identify this as wrong, lacking character and lacking the proper process. I understand the council has indicated there is little they can do to stop this, but little does not mean nothing. Little is a vote of no confidence. Little is a call for the mayor's resignation. Little shows the world that whether or not you condone this or if you're willing to do what it takes to do what you can to do what might be hard right now to take a stance against what is wrong, please do what little that you can. I very much appreciate you staying up late to address these issues and have a great night. Thank you. Um, next is Paul Colgrove, followed by Michael Lynn. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. We can hear you. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much for staying up. I have to echo what Sue just said uh, when she's there. It does appear that this is a cabal run by the financial health team and Andy Shore. I hate to say it looks like Smirka is involved in this. You hired Clark as the chief lawyer to be the fall guy here. Um, you know, when you look at this whole thing, they worked on this program for two years after uh, Mankin Vance got that RFP, and they had all these meetings, and then they spring all this on in the last two weeks. Um, that goes back to Mankin Vance. When you look at those charts they gave you, you should notice when they figured out how much trouble Lansing is in, in their actuality charts, which they say they're not, obviously they're not because they use the word medium instead of median. There are 1,520 cities in Lansing. We're or in the state. We're the sixth largest with almost 120,000. They actuarially compared us to a city of 2,200. So they cook their books to make this look good. Don't be deceived get an actuarial study, go after these things. Um, they were as slick as any patent medicine salesman in the old West. Um, and they really have a callous disregard for information. After that, Kimberly said, well, you just call Humana and there's a concierge and they, oh, your number to call for express scripts is on your letter. I immediately got my letter out I looked at my letter, there is no such number on there. That's a bold-faced lie. And those webinars, Mayor Shore gave the wrong dates, number one. Number two, just remember, all of you ask yourself how old your grandparents are right now and ask them how computer savvy they are. And by the way, when they signed on, the first thing they were told is, you don't have an, or your account's not active, you can't get in, you have to go here, and then you have to go there. Nobody attended these webinars um, because they didn't know how to get in. So they don't have the information. By the way, either do you. The stuff you got from Madkin Vance, I would, I would take them to a third party and have them look at them. You're getting sold. As Susan said, you can stand on the right side of this or you can stand with the mayor and be on the wrong side. You're gonna to go to court. The disability ranks are gonna fill up. I've got to take a trip to the oncologist and the cardiologist. I'm a firefighter. I'll be seeing you for disability. You're gonna see a lot of us that way. You're not saving any money. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Next we have Michael Lynn followed by Sarah. All right, thank you guys. Um, I'm gonna get to what I've been waiting to get to. Um, first of all, on the U-Haul thing, I'm very disappointed and a couple of you council members that, that voted yes on that. I just can't imagine. Uh, Jeremy Garza, that's your district. He voted no, meaning he speak to the constituents that live in that area. Everybody else should have been able to follow suit in that aspect. 
East side, Brandon Betts and, and one doesn't make any sense why you would have voted yes on that. Uh, uh, I think Kathy Wood or Kathy uh, Dunbar voted yes on that. I, I just can't understand. It makes no sense to me, but okay, whatever. Um, I'd like to echo uh, everybody else's sentiment and aspect of each one of you council members is now complicit. You guys let it get to the end of the year before you took any action. We haven't seen the mayor have to answer to any of the wrongdoings that have gone on over the last three years. Uh, the death in the jail is still unanswered. This Hulon family doesn't get to take a vacation and sit back for their for their holiday. And we have asked you, I have asked over and over again of my, of my council member, Brandon Betts, who put out the open letter that he was in disgust of this mayor and everything that he's done, but too cowardly to put out a, a vote of no confidence. I can't understand that for the life of me, how you can be in that position and feel as strongly as you do about this mayor and not believe that that is appropriate in nature to at least stand on what you said and how you feel about this mayor and his position. And every single one of you council members who've left it all on Brandon Betts is just as cowardly. You all know that this is wrong. You all know that you have to take a side on this thing. There is gonna be a right and a wrong side. You all will fall in that wrong side. And if you guys are having conversations that I'm just not hearing or that we're not hearing as a people, first of all, you will be wrong for that in nature as well. Because if we're not hearing, if you, you guys are having backdoor conversations about this Hulan murder and you guys are having backdoor conversations about this retiree healthcare and all the other stuff that the public doesn't get a chance to hear, that's wrong in itself as well. Who is hearing the response? Where do they kill somebody inside of a jail and a mayor never has to come on and answer any questions and then can lay it all on COVID of why they don't have to answer to the people. And you all are our representatives of that. Every single one of you represents a district of people who care about something. It's not just Mike Lynn here crying about the mayor or crying about black and brown community or crying about this or that. You've got people from all walks of life you got people who were plumbers, who were service workers, trash men, fire, police. Everybody is calling for you all to stand up and speak for them. Y'all should all be ashamed of yourself. Why is it that I, a city worker who's fighting for his own life very privately, has to fight so vividly and loud for the people of the city who are begging you all to stand on them? I have much respect for you guys because you guys do deal with a lot of stuff, but this is one I can't understand for the life of me how you do not get behind is calling this out for what it is, standing on something and letting it be known you do not stand with this mayor and what he's done here. The history books will express all of this. Those seats will be available. Y'all take care, have a happy Christmas. Some people don't get that chance. Thank you. Next we have Sarah followed by Mark Parker and Sarah, we don't have okay. a that. Real quickly to, um, we're the ones that are having the computer problem. So Chris would like to say something after me if we can restart two for one kind of, <laughs> to save you some time. Um, I wanted to say a couple of things about Kimberly Coolis and her, um, her statements regarding the retiree healthcare information. First of all, she's talking as though $500 or a thousand is no big deal. Well, maybe it isn't if you work for Markham Vance and you make a big salary, I'm not really sure. But for those that live on 10 or 12,000 a year, that's a lot of money. And we used to not have a deductible. Well, we did, but you had to go out of network to do it. You had a benefit for staying in network. Um, when she says, you know, all the retirees were informed We've talked to so many that haven't even gotten letters, not one letter, let alone a packet. Then you've got her saying, Amwins knows all the information. You can actually ask them. Amwins tells over 65 to call Humana. PHP and Blue Cross say, call the city. <laughs> so she makes it sound like this big rosy picture. No, it's been a cluster. People have been taken off primary insurances. Things have been substituted. It's been an absolute disaster. She's really ill-informed too when it comes to your disability. I know we keep mentioning this, but partly because I'm trying to make you guys see the cost to the city for disabled workers, whether you're working. She said, well, if you're working, we'll help you understand your insurance. Okay, no, I think we understand it. We've been paying for it all the way along. But if you're gonna change it up on us, it's the city that's now responsible for that copay, that balance, anything related to that injury or the complications thereof. When you've got all that stuff going, then you've got fire and police, any fireman, any police officer that develops cancer or cardiac issues, even after they retire. State of Michigan law says it is assumed to be presumed, I should say, to be contracted through the job that you worked. Um, 
it, it, she doesn't understand it. So, so you guys have a problem with this company that Mayor Shores hired because they, they don't have their facts straight. This is straight from the attorney. The state of Michigan says you're responsible till that person dies. Now, maybe this is a way to kick them off. I'm not sure. Um, anyone, I was curious, anyone on that FHT ever work in healthcare? Do they have any clue how billing actually works? I'd like to know who, uh, who else it was that actually supplied bids and actually see those because things just do not look right with all of this. Um, and, and the big thing that MV said is we've got to reduce that liability. Really? Because everything that we've heard um, from Judy Keeler, of course, the mayor's been pretty silent and things. Nobody is saying that it's actually going to go to that unfunded liability. They've got it spread out all over things. It's not just about the unfunded liability. So if that's what we're fixing, we've already paid our part. We funded it in 1998 with, I think, uh, 4 million was the number. And then on top of that, they made concessions. They did all those things. It's the city that has not made their deposits. They haven't even made one, I don't think, for 2020 yet. You're blaming us again, so you're double dipping. We got to pay a second time around for that. I, look at the big picture, you guys. It's still going to cost thank, you. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you like to go to Chris, or would you like him? Yeah, to, let's uh, go ahead to Chris because I think okay. if we skip down, we're gonna we're gonna. All right, get that over with. To Chris, and then we'll go to Mark. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be short and sweet on this. I just want a couple points that I noticed. Uh, the insurance people and the city attorney contradicted each other many, many times. I mean, they stumbled over each other quite a few times. Uh, that MV company, I think they're worthless. This Humana plan is the worst insurance that the city is going with. I mean, it's really going to slam the retirees. It's horrible. Uh, it's, it's shameful. It's shameful. Uh, number three. Uh, oh, here I was just wondering. This is for the mayor. Uh, why do you think you deserve a raise right now when you're cutting retirees' benefits and uh, causing all this strife with the retirees? Silence. I figured. Uh, my last point, why won't you speak to the public? You flat out lied about what you were going to do. I will not touch the legacy, the, the retirees', retirees legacy no, okay. on the health care. You said that, everybody knows it, and you won't talk about it. I mean... You know, us unruly group of 60 to 80 year olds, you know, we're, we're like the hell's angels, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would just like to, once again, just say, I, I think it's a no vote in the count, in mm -hmm. confidence. And I really think that the, that the uh, mayor needs to resign. Something's on here, it's dirty, it's back door. Everybody knows it. It's out in the open. We're going to keep a watch on it. And believe me, we've got a lot. And I mean, a lot of law looking at this stuff. Really? So I just uh, just wanted to make those points. So thank you very much. Have a Merry Christmas and uh, hope you have a good New Year. Thank you. So we will now go on to... Mark Parker and then Christy. And I'm hello. Yeah. Hello, folks. Okay. Hello. Uh are, that's weird. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the mock and vance. Uh let's see the mock and vance uh, report. Uh, what they did confirm was that the most impacted people will be the people with like the, the chronic uh, uh, serious problems over 65, like the, for example, the cancer treatment. Uh, those people will be uh, very impacted. Uh, and because their pensions are so small, they'll be, they're the ones that are getting left behind by this, by this, uh, new, these healthcare reductions. Uh, and instead of, uh, 
trying to do an expose on Brian Leffler in a minute and a half, which didn't work out so well. I'll, uh, I'm going to send you uh, a short email by the great uh, um, East Lansing investigative reporter, Alice Drager. Uh, she did a great job on uh, just showing uh, what he's been doing in East Lansing. And uh, I think it's important to, uh, to think that maybe, you know, East Lansing's past might be Lansing's future. So um, anyway, I, I hope you folks have a good holiday and uh, we'll, we'll talk later. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next is Christy followed by Sarah Weekman. Hi, my name is Christy Bartholomew. As I said during the Committee of the Whole, and I want to remind Mayor Shore, I'm a duty disabled, duty disabled firefighter. While listening to the testimony of um, Mac and Vance during the tail end of the Committee of the Whole, my worst fears were realized. As I stated in my testimony earlier, I received a three page document telling me my health care was going to change, but did not give me any details, did not tell me who to call, did not give me any information as to what it was changing to and how my disability injuries and equipment that I need to treat the injuries and the medications that I need to treat the injuries, that three page letter that came unsigned said absolutely nothing. The idea that uh, Mark Ann Vance's gal named Kimberly, the advisor, she came off so arrogant and so contrite, it was obscene. She is at best uninformed to what the duty disabled have been provided with and at worst, She's just not prepared, as I mentioned, in the Committee of the Whole. No one under 65 in general has been presented with any literature, much less webinars and booklets of our coverage or phone numbers of who to call. How long will the disabled have to suffer before our health care, including workers' comp cases, are reopened? We're less than three weeks before this is supposed to switch over. How are we going to know what our benefits are supposed to be if no one tells us? We've had zero guidance. So what are we supposed to do? January 1 is less than three weeks away. And there are people that are going to need medication. There are people that are going to need equipment. There are people that have been burned over 40% of their body. And thankfully, they lived and require special hosiery because they have so much scar tissue. You guys don't have a plan. Aquan Vance doesn't have a plan. What are we going to do? I yield my time. Thank you. Um, next, we have Sherry Wiegman followed by Julia Hillary. Hi, good evening, or actually good morning. Um, <laughs> thank you for sticking with us and talking about the um, retiree health care. Um, one of the things that Manklin Vance didn't show tonight was the family plan. They showed the single plan, but not the family plan. And the costs for the family plan are significantly higher than the single plan, approximately $12,000 per family. Um, <laughs> um, I also want to let the council know my husband and I never received any letter from the city of Lansing in September that was supposedly mailed out, nor have we received anything from Humana. So does that mean on January 1, we're still going to have the same coverage that we have presently? Um, I, and I can tell you that we're not the only people that haven't received that letter, nor anything from Humana. I want to reiterate if Smirka is recusing himself and waiting on an opinion for the ethics committee, how can he issue an opinion? 
Also, where is the money going that is supposedly being saved by reducing retiree health care? What is the plan? And further, why hasn't the city been following the ordinance that said retiree health care is to be funded every year? Is it just balancing the budget for the finance and treasury department that they don't care about ordinances? That's a question that needs to be answered. Further, I believe there needs to be forensic accounting and audit of the city to determine where monies have gone since Mayor Schur has been in office. And there needs to be a public release of exactly how much money Mankin Vance is going to be making off the money, off the savings they say the city of Lansing will get. I would also ask that all bids garnered under the RFP that ultimately ended up being awarded to Mankin Vance be made public. Also, given that Mr. Clark said he didn't have all the current collective bargaining agreements for his legal opinion, and those collective bargaining agreements don't expire until 2023, how does that justify reducing retiree health care? That is a violation of collective bargaining agreements. And Mr. Clark's legal opinion specifically states that there should be no reduction in retiree health care without addressing it through collective bargaining. A point of clarification, the pension funds are in great shape. So what Mayor Shore is saying is a reason to reduce retiree health care is pure blarney. Further by saying retirees need to have the same health care as current city of Lansing employees is ridiculous as retirees do not get pay raises. Point of information, my social security is being increased by 1.3% in 2021. I added that up and for the Thank you ma'am for your time year, this evening. That amount is, mm, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Julia Hillary followed by Sue. Hello, everybody. Um, this has been a very interesting meeting. I have sat here and listened to at least two um, building companies or uh, people that want to build in the city talk about that they have been talking with the city for years in regards to these projects. But this, the Lansing retirees have not been given that, that same consideration. When the mayor came on um, and addressed the council when his buddies were on, um, he talked about he did all he could do to solve the issue. But the one group that he never talked to was the retirees themselves. He could have got a whole lot of information because if you'll notice, you have people that have negotiated contracts. You have people that have been in the finance office. You have people that have done all kinds of things and they and have extensive experience as they have stated and he never talked to any of them until last month for one meeting and a lot of these issues that have come up could have been resolved now i get if that at, there's an issue but to force us with less than three months to plan, prepare, and do things for these changes is ridiculous. And somebody said earlier, heck, when I was a police officer, we were just going from handwriting um, reports to computer reports. And all the older officers, guess what? They didn't know how to do the computer. And because I was the new one, guess who what? They wanted to do all the reports because they didn't know how to do them on the computer. So. It's the same concept. If you're going to constantly throw things at people and say, get on these Zoom calls and do this and do that. I mean, half of these Zoom calls had X, Z, Y, N, 3, 7, 2, 7 to punch in as the, as the um, code. Ridiculous. They should have been made some, they, they can change those, those uh, codes to make it easy for people to get in. And, but they didn't want it to be, make it easy to get in. The fact that you have people that are trying to build buildings in the city of Lansing get more time and respect than the, the retirees in making these changes and they never came to the retirees to find out who are disabled, who, who's this, who's that is absolutely ridiculous. 
that's all I have to say. Thank you. Next, we have Sue followed by Aiden Wood. Hi, I just want to say that, um, Carol, I don't think you should um, agree with Smirka giving you his opinion in two weeks. That's unacceptable. And less than two weeks is the first of the year. He needs to say what he wants to say right now, how he feels, and we already know how he feels about it. I am just sick about all the people that freaking lie tonight that was talking about the insurance. It's gonna be $6,500 for one person, but if you're married, it's more than that. And it's just ridiculous that I've been watching Mayor Shore's facial expressions and everything. He's not listening to us. He keeps on looking around and that he does not give a crap about the retirees or about the city. He just wants what he wants. And it's just ridiculous. We need to find out something soon. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's so sad and how these older people are just don't know what to do. And I just think we got to have some answers, not just talk, talk, talk. The mayor has never talked to any of us. In the beginning of this meeting early at five o'clock, he wasn't even here listening to anything. And I'm just sick and tired of just waiting for the ball to drop. And I feel like all they think of as us retirees are that we are, we're dead old cows and we still have a lot of spunk in us. And watch out, sure, you're going to get it. Thank you. Next is Aiden Wood, followed by Dan Rydell. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I uh, wasn't actually going to speak today, but oh, wow, that uh, presentation earlier just really infuriated me. Um, and I would request if the city wants to do a presentation like that to appease the angry masses to at least find some people who are a little less fucking condescending. Um, like the talking about an increase of a deductible from $0 to $500, like, oh, it's nothing. Like, why are you even complaining? It's just absolutely infuriating, especially from people who will very likely never have to be in the position of our retirees. One of the slides said that the scenario of, uh, for a retiree out of pocket, um, if there's a $500,000 hospital claim, um, on the current plan is $0, and on the new plan would be $15,000. Um, I believe this was Kimberly who said, so as you can see, a lot of people think this is going to be some sort of exponential increase, but it's really not. Um, to Kimberly, I would like to say, please go fuck yourself. Ma'am, Sherry, please stop the timer. You're, uh, you're allowed to continue your, your um, comment, but please bear in mind, you have to mind your language on this. Uh, we are broadcasting on cable television. You have two minutes. You know what, I just yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you, next we have Dan Rydell followed by Denise. This is actually Amy and I will hold my language, but I feel her frustrations. So my son actually spoke earlier and he was the young man who has been hearing week after week our frustrations, not only mine, but other retirees, because I am trying to yield some of these calls and help other people who have not received information. So just to reiterate, when Kimberly sat there and stated that people have received information, I can still tell you that no, not everyone has. Uh, the group under 65 still has not had any kind of webinar. The over 65 groups, because I, I posted about them, had a very difficult time trying to get in. So the information may have been available to them. However, it's been very difficult for them to utilize the information. Um, when I've personally tried calling for plan documents to compare, because my situation is a little bit different than most, I have had a heck of a time um, getting it. And that's a word I will use lightly. It's been nearly impossible. I have an insurance history. I worked for the state doing insurance before. I know how this works. And you literally get bounced from one person to the next to the next. And being a younger retiree, I can kind of tolerate that. But for those who are a little bit older, might have a harder time doing so and probably just give up. And that's kind of where they're at. So they just feel the frustrations and move on. So one of the points I was going to make was that Ms. Spitzley earlier had made a comment about the Detroit and Flint cities and that we are not comparing the same things here. And I agree 100% with that. We're not, we're not like Detroit. We're not like Flint. Yes, our crime's getting worse. However, in totality, our, our cities are much different. I think our plans for pension 
insurance and everything in a whole is much different. So I think when we look at these things, we really need, we need to look at them in a better way than how things are set up because I don't believe that we're looking at the same things either. Um, as far as uh, Mr. Betts, I've never seen you smile. So please smile right now, it's my birthday, okay? Give me a birthday, they got it, thanks. All right, so utilities, you guys have a you know discussion about turning utilities off during a pandemic. I just think it's really important too that we don't change healthcare during a pandemic. This was not a normal year for people to use healthcare. And we have to understand that whether the plan starts January 1st or July 1st, we're gonna have a huge impact on the older generation of people who don't have the ability to go get a job. You have to understand as well that we don't have social security coming to us to offset certain costs. And I believe someone already mentioned it, but it was one of my points too, that if we are going to be paying the working people's co-pays and et cetera, we need to have that working person's wage most people on disability cannot get jobs to offset that cost either. So I just think that there's a lot of things here that really need to be looked at maybe in greater depth, um, but I won't keep rambling and I appreciate all of your time and that you're still here. Have a good night. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to Denise followed by Galaxy S10. Hi, can, can you hear, hear me? Yes, Denise. Okay. okay, my name is Denise Lynch. I retired from the city in 2010. I was with Parks and Recreation. Uh, I loved my job. I left. One of the things that um, incentivized me to leave at the time was uh, there was an early, early retirement incentive that involved my health care. And I know that was alluded to tonight, but um, so I may be in a special situation. I'm just, I'm just um, stating that at this point. And I'm tired as, as all of you are. So um, I'm not gonna repeat all of the earlier comments because it's been a long night, but I do concur with the majority of what I've heard. Um, I will say that the rollout of these changes has been very stressful. It's been awkward. It's been bungled. And in my opinion, it's created a lot of undue stress and anxiety on people and particularly older people. I'm an older people, but I'm not, um, you know, there's some that are, uh, don't have computers. I have an old computer. I use my cell phone. Okay. But a lot of people don't even have that. I they're struggling and I felt so bad for the, um, Carol read the letter from the gentleman where his mother called him crying because she was pulled off her health care, just transferred without any notice. And, you know, thank God she had a son she could call to straighten the situation out. But some people don't have that. After the committee, the whole earlier, um, I communicated with one of my fellow retirees and she's in the over 65 group and she still hasn't received anything. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ham handed, ham handed. It's terrible. Um, plus I feel like it's been secretive. A lot of the key people have been left out of the loop. Council, as you know, you were blindsided. The unions were blindsided, the retirees were, even the benefits office. The benefits office person, Mary, I feel like she wasn't properly kept in the loop. And that's who we call for our information. It's, it's terrible. A um, Couple more points here, I'm pissed off. Um, in all my years with the city, and some of you know me personally, all my years with the city, I've never, ever seen anything handled like this, ever. I think it's terrible the way this has been handled, very unprofessionally, and I don't blame the council. I, I'm, I'm appreciative that the council is there to hear us, that somebody's listening. But it's Mayor, I'm very disappointed in you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your time. Uh, we have now have Galaxy S. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, yeah, my name is. 
Hello, now we can't hear you. Hello? Uh, now I can hear you. Okay. Oh, okay. It said, it said something about making me a panelist. Um, I don't know what happened, but um, yeah, my name is Jonathan. I'm from Lansing. And uh, so one of the issues that I wanted to bring up was the uh, unhoused community behind the New Hope Center. Um, so <clears throat> they were told that they needed to leave Friday and then the time that they had there was extended, um, I believe for an additional two weeks, but um, I want to make sure that Andy is held accountable for that. If that is genuinely the situation with the community that's living behind there, because a lot of them are uh, elderly and they have medical problems um, and it's not easy to just move them to another location, even if there's another location set up. Um, there's there's been a lot of efforts for people to go back there and you know help clean up the area because I know that was one of the stipulations for them to be able to stay there was for uh, the area to be cleaned up. So um, I feel like if you know the area is maintained that they should just be able to live there continuously for as long as possible. I mean, there's no reason why they should why they should have to um, move. And also to uh, speak about what a couple other people were talking about earlier with Anthony Helon, his uh, murder. His death was ruled as a murder by the coroner's office, but how are these jail guards being held responsible? They should all be facing criminal charges if they're not already. They should uh, <clears throat> be facing murder charges because they murdered him, I mean, in cold blood. So, you know, that's just absolutely ridiculous. Also, with Darinisha Clay, that's another incident. Um, I mean, what happened to her happened, uh, you know, five years ago, but it's, we don't forget about these things. The city's not going to forget about it. The people are not going to forget about it. Um, I mean, she was executed and she was, you know, she was only 17 and she had mental health problems. Um, they said she had scissors. They took the scissors out of her hands and then they shot her in the stomach. And while she could, while she was on her knees, they shot her in the head. That's an execution. That's absolutely ridiculous. And that officer has not faced any criminal charges either. Um, and also for the, uh, another thing is the Black Lives Matter mural that's at the Capitol. Um, I was one of the people that helped to fundraise for that. Um, the, I started the fundraiser and um, it's been defaced multiple times. Artists have been out there six, seven, eight times uh, to repaint that. Um, so for about four months, we had cones set up around it. Um, there was a perimeter to keep that lane safe and to keep the mural safe. Um, but recently the cones were taken off and people decided to drive over it, do burnouts on it and skid on it and damage the mural once again. So I'm just asking that the city uh, do something about protecting this mural. It's incredibly important to the, uh, the black and the BIPOC community of Lansing. So um, if you can consider uh, protecting that in some way, that would be amazing. So yeah, that's all. <clears throat> okay, thank you. That was our final speaker. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I know you all would love for me to delay adjourning this evening, but I think at 12.30 a.m. on December 15th, I will declare the Lansing City Council adjourned for 2020. Thank you all and have a good evening.